The U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation will come to order. Today we're having an oversight hearing on the U.S. airline industry and the PSP program. We have a distinguished uh, panel of witnesses. Oh, I think some are joining us remotely. So thank you very much for all being here today. Uh, I know that some of our colleagues, we just had a vote called in our running to do that and we'll be back. But again, I wanna thank uh, American Airlines and uh, CEO, Mr. Parker, for being here, uh, Southwest Airlines, Mr. Kelly, for being here, Scott Kirby, the CEO of United Airlines, Mr. Lafter, is that just how I pronounce it right? Lofter, Lauder, thank you, um, representing Delta Airlines, and Ms. Nelson representing the uh, flight attendants. And I believe remotely we have Someone from my part of the world, anyway, um, British, British Columbia, uh, North Pacific Northwest, Mr. Uh, sorry, sir. Mr. Uh, is it Trith? Uh, let's see, Trethworth. Trethworth. Trethaway. Trethaway, Mr. Trethaway. Trethaway. Thank really? you. Thank you so much. You're going to be leading us off after I make a few comments and Senator Wicker, but certainly uh, appreciate you uh, and your company in analyzing transportation. The immediate question before the committee today is whether the payroll support program for the airline worked. As we will hear from our panelists today, economists, union presidents, and airline executives, the answer to that question is yes. The payroll support program was a historic investment to sustain a critical sector of the U.S. economy. Aviation amounts to more than 5% of U.S. GDP and contributes 1.8 trillion in total economic activity. By ensuring airlines had funding to continue to pay their employees wages and salaries and benefits, the payroll support program saved the jobs and livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of workers. And I'm sure that that is the story we're going to hear. Specifically though, the relief saved 386 1,200 direct full-time U.S. passenger airline jobs, approximately 85% of the pre-pandemic workforce, according to data reported by the major airlines. In addition, the workforce aid indirectly supported 300, over 340,000 jobs, including 74,000, uh, higher than 74,000 in the supply chain. This is one of the great things about this uh, program is that it went through the entire ecosystem of aviation. Today, the U.S. domestic capacity is 87% of the pre-pandemic levels, which is above our peer markets in Europe and Asia. I think these two charts probably show it best in the gap, the United States being the blue line, and uh, in this case, Europe, Europe thank you, um, being in, in the red. The fact that the United States acted quickly and continually built on that showed the difference in what we were able to restore for aviation tra travel. To look specifically over that same time period in the various months, again, where we are today, you can see it's more people have uh, started to catch up where the United States is. But during this time period, the United States was able to move faster. That meant a lot to our economy. It meant a lot to those families and to the workers. And the fact that as of September 2021, airlines were only 8% uh, under their pre-pandemic levels. So we know that this means good news for the future. We will hear testimony, um, as I said, from an economist who is going to tell us why the United States proposal uh, and program worked so well and how it helped us retain experienced and trained workforce individuals and why that is so important as we move forward. Uh, in Mr. Trentworthy's words, correctly focusing on the key objectives of retaining airline industry workforce and ensuring continuity of economic and social connectivity was an important goal. Indeed, the payroll support program provided relief to other parts of the aviation system, including contractors, repair stations, service providers, and I wanna thank my colleagues, specifically Senator Duckworth and Senator Peters, who focused on that. Airlines were also required to service 662 U.S. destinations, including some small communities that might otherwise have lost service in the pandemic, and as a result, U.S. airlines continue to operate 
5,936 weekly frequencies to these destinations, amounting to over 300,000 frequencies per year. This service guarantee ensured that the national system of air transportation network remained open for business. It was critical for supplies, including vaccines and the healthcare system that everyone was counting on. But let's be clear, this success was not a foregone conclusion. This required Congress to act immediately, and I wanna thank my colleague, Senator Wicker, and uh, the team of people on this committee on both sides of the aisle who worked day and night for weeks and worked with the various counterparts in the House and in the private sector to, and the White House to try to come up with this proposal. With the market demand collapsing at record speed, bottoming out at nearly 5% of pre-pandemic levels within weeks, the payroll support program provided a degree of confidence and certainty in the marketplace. We know the PSP program worked because U.S. airlines kept frontline workers employed and were able to capture the air rebound that I just showed in those charts. In January 2021, the U.S. domestic passenger volumes were at 42% of pre-pandemic levels, and by last week, they were at 87%. This is a 107% increase in domestic airline capacity in 2021 and indicates domestic travel could be fully back by 2022. In contrast, as the chart showed, other nations weren't at that same capacity. In fact, I think Asia Pacific is lingering around 53%. Again, we have a different market, different complexities. So as designed, the PSP helped us preserve skills and high paying jobs critical to our economy. And I can't wait to hear from the witnesses in more detail. According to the Treasury Department, out of the 54 billion in PSP funds, the airlines must repay 14 billion, which is 26%. The Treasury holds warrants that are currently worth over $200 million. And uh, the committee is asking for an assessment of what uh, we would have spent if the US government would have taken care of that same population on unemployment benefits. We've heard estimates of anywhere around $20 billion to, so we know that in the end, it would have been still a lot of cost to the federal government. So the committee will be working on a full report in the new year about this program and today's hearing informs us um, about some of those details the committee would like to know. Obviously, during this time period, um, there were challenges, outages, weather events, workforce challenges. I'm sure that we will hear from our witnesses about those and questions from my colleagues uh, on those disruptions and what we should do. Uh, we also, I'm sure, will hear about consumer delays and cancellations of flights and refunds. Consumer refunds and complaints against U.S. airlines did skyrocket um, in 2020 and the Department of Transportation re reports uh, a, fourth, a huge increase over 2029. While 2021 is better, there are still complaints uh, with more than 5,500 refund complaints so far. And we here know that the law requires airlines to re provide refunds to consumers for airline-driven cancellations, and we expect airlines to comply with that law. Tomorrow, we will hear from the general counsel nominee uh, to DOT, who will be in charge of this issue, and we look forward to hearing their comments. So again, um, I want to note that while we have uh, witnesses here before us today, just in the interest of time and committee uh, participation and dialogue, we have asked other airlines, Alaska, JetBlue, and Spirit, to provide written testimony that will be part of the record my colleagues should feel free to uh, ask questions for the record of those airlines as well. Uh, I know that we're in a better place than where we would have been if we hadn't done the PSP program. I hope that uh, we can also share the thanks to uh, Jerry Petrella in Senator Schumer's office and Scott Robb in Senator McConnell's office for their hard work on this program as well and would like to now turn it over to my colleague, Senator Wicker, for his comments. Madam Chair, I'm, um, I'm sitting here wondering if I should simply yield back my time and say that I subscribe wholly to uh, everything you said in your statement. But I think I'll go ahead. Uh, um, like big, 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 she, she had hope for a moment. Beginning in March of last year, COVID-19 
began to devastate air travel. In the ensuing weeks, passenger air traffic was reduced to a trickle and the commercial aviation sector faced the possibility of bankruptcies and layoffs for hundreds of thousands of workers. The National Air Transportation Network, which Americans rely upon, was at risk of collapsing by establishing the Payroll Support Program, PSP, as part of the CARES Act, Congress acted boldly to help the industry weather the storm and to preserve a national air service for big cities and small towns alike. I'm proud to have been part of the bipartisan effort to create PSP. A spokesman for the Allied Pilots Association Union was exactly right when he said recently that, quote, PSP was an over-the-top success Without it, the airline industry would have collapsed, end of quote. It's worth noting two important aspects of PSP. First, it required airlines to continue serving all the markets they served before the pandemic, even as demand vanished. Second, the assistance provided covered pay and benefits for frontline workers, pilots, flight attendants, gate agents, and service contractors, but not senior management. Furthermore, the passenger air... Uh, the passenger airline PSP covered only 77% of the total payroll cost for the largest 11 airlines. In other words, PSP was a necessary lifeline, not a windfall. And that lifeline worked. In fact, one recent analysis found that nearly 400,000 direct passenger airline jobs were saved. This figure does not include the jobs saved by PSP funds that were directed to cargo airlines and aviation service contractors. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic and its catastrophic impact on passenger demand lasted far longer than any of us had hoped or anticipated. In the fall of 2020, Senator Collins and I introduced legislation to extend PSP past its original expiration date of September 30, 2020. Even though the bill had 24 bipartisan co-sponsors, I regret that uh, somehow Congress was unable to act in time to prevent a lapse of the PSP program. In December of last year, Congress extended PSP in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, but the nearly three-month lapse in the program, along with lower demand, created a period of uncertainty, forcing the aviation industry to adjust staffing levels through voluntary furloughs and buyouts. Fortunately, the second round of PSP paved the way for airlines to rehire employees who had left voluntarily. If that gap in PSP and the uncertainty it caused could have been avoided, the airlines would have been better positioned to handle the resurgence in air travel demand and operational challenges. As the COVID-19 vaccine rollout began, the demand for passenger air travel returned faster than anticipated. Over the summer of 2021, we saw many instances in which some airlines were overly ambitious and passengers paid the price. No one likes flight delays or cancellations. Having thousands of customers stranded and unable to get to their destinations is frustrating and unacceptable, but those disruptions should not lead us to question whether PSP was the right decision. PSP kept the airlines from collapsing entirely. PSP is the reason flight cancellations were limited to mere days and not months and years. And PSP is the reason ticket prices did not skyrocket. I call that a success, and I join the chair of this committee in saying that boldly. Now, there have been delays and cancellations. It appears that airlines have heard the traveling public's frustration with that. But this Thanksgiving's travel weekend went off with minimal disruption. More than 20 million passengers flew safely and got to their destinations. PSP was meant to save the air transportation system not to be a guarantee of smooth flying for everyone everywhere. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how they are taking steps to prevent any further mass delays and cancellations while maintaining flexibility during the ongoing pandemic. And once again, I join the chair of this committee in uh, saying that PSP was a resounding bipartisan success, and, um, and I'm glad to have been a part of it. I yield back to you. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Senator Wicker, and uh, again, thank you for your leadership on the issue. And again, I, I don't think anybody has really a concept of how fast the United States uh, worked, but it was very fast and uh, really a almost two, two and a half week sprint of just every day till we figured this out. So, 
We will now turn to our witnesses. We're going to start with you, Mr. Trethaway, uh, for a more global view, so it's very appropriate that you have a big map of the world behind you, and welcome to, to the committee. Uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts about the, uh, the PSP. Um, I'm Dr. Mike Trethaway, um, PhD, University of Wisconsin in Economics. I'm Chief Economist of InterVistas Consulting. Uh, we're a global transportation and tourism consulting uh, practice, and I work out of both our uh, Washington, D.C. and Vancouver offices and have, have a home in Wisconsin. Um, I understand that industry representatives have been invited to provide evidence on specific impacts uh, on the industry's work Force and recent operational issues. So I'm not going to address those issues. What I'd like to do is focus on international comparisons of what other nations did and how the U.S. compares to that. Um, I, I have worked internationally uh, for over 40 years and find that international comparisons can be very insightful. In brief, it's my opinion based on my 40 years of experience that the PSP and the overall policy response of Congress the unprecedented severe and sudden impact of the COVID-19 crisis was exemplary, and I would suggest it was best in class in the world. Um, while any major policy dealing with a complex in industry might not be perfect, the U.S. response met standards in eight key policy categories. The consequence has been that the U.S. is emerging more quickly, as you've seen on, on the chart, more quickly from the crisis and better poised to maintain market forces and not government regulation and direction as the driver of the industry in the recovery period in the coming decade. So I'm going to briefly comment on each of the policy categories I identified. First, the response was immediate. Um, a comment just, just a moment ago from the Senator was that um, people don't have any concept of how fast the U.S. responded. I do. There are many nations right now that still haven't figured out their policy in the COVID market. So the response the U.S. provided, it was immediately. It did not take months and months. Second, that response provided certainty and therefore was confidence building for both the industry and the traveling public. Third, it's my view that the response was fair in the sense that unlike many other nations, such as Germany, Congress did not choose a single champion airline to support through the pandemic and provide it and only it, or largely it, with generous support. Congress stood ready to provide support to any and all qualifying airlines, airports, and other aviation supply chain businesses. Fourth, this policy was transparent. Congress's policy, the amount of support to be provided, the rules for access to that support, were public and clear for all to see. In many other countries, the amount of support, who would get it, and the rules are still opaque. Fifth, the policy was focused on supporting economic and social connectivity and workforce retention. In my view, this is one of the most important aspects of Congress's policy. The policy objectives were clear to ensure the continuing economic and social connectivity of the nation, and secondly, to ensure the continuity of the aviation workforce. This workforce takes years to train, and over decades it took to develop a strong safety culture. There was risk that a slow response, an impartial and imperfect response, would compromise retention of the workforce. This is in contrast to other nations, where the focus was not on the key elements of connectivity and continuity of the workforce. For example, Canada initially had no aviation specific program, only a general program available to any sector of the economy. Um, a consequence of that is because it didn't focus on maintaining connectivity, many Canadian communities lost all of their commercial air service. Wage support that was followed in a number of nations is not the same as maintaining continuity of connectivity. Sixth, the support program was comprehensive in coverage of the entire aviation supply chain. Most other nations focused on their airlines. A few might have added airports, but ignored the rest of the supply chain. Congress's program covered everything 
including air cargo, manufacturing of aircraft, the whole supply chain. Seven, and this is very important to me as a market economist, the policy was grounded in retaining competition and market forces as the primary drivers of sector activities. The evidence is not only strong, but extremely strong that the benefits to the traveling public and aviation dependent businesses derive from market oriented policies in, in the US. I and many of my colleagues around the world in aviation economics are apprehensive that the post pandemic era will find the playing field no longer to be level with governments having chosen specific champion carriers and provided significant support and in many cases, direct government intervention in decisions of these carriers. Finally, the policy was designed to position the aviation sector for a more rapid recovery and for competing globally in the post pandemic era. Many other nations, as I indicated, champion airlines were, were, were chosen. Uh, many of the airlines elsewhere will survive, but with massive amounts of debt that will burden these carriers, result in higher fares and reduced uh, travel. The US program found an appropriate balance between direct support and debt so that the airlines and the whole aviation ecosystem will come out of this in a financially viable position for the long term. In sum, these criteria, in my view, are appropriate for assessing the US policy response to the COVID-19 crisis. Several nations have done well on one or more of these criteria, but the US is unique in achieving top marks in every category. The PSP will enable the US aviation sector to meet the current and future economic and social connectivity needs of Americans. Thank you, Thank Mr. Trethwood. Thank you so much. And I will remind our witnesses, if you can stick to five minutes, it'd be so appreciated. We appreciate your um, uh, comments, Mr. Trethworthy. And uh, we will now go to Mr. Parker. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, like Ranking Member Wicker, I'm tempted to cede my time because the chair's comments were so consistent with mine. But, but, <laughs> but like Ranking Member Wicker, I also would like to, say, to give my remarks, mainly because I want to thank the two of you. Uh, and the rest of this committee. Um, we at American Airlines are deeply grateful for the pandemic assistance we received through the CARES Act and the payroll support program. We're extremely appreciative of everyone who made it possible, including the members of this committee. You showed leadership at a time that it was needed most, and you demonstrated a commitment to our industry and our team members that made a lasting impact. So I'd like to take a moment to say thank you and to assure you uh, that the support of the U.S. government extended to us was well worth it. I want to state it succinctly and un unequivocally, the payroll support program has been an overwhelming success. American Airlines fought hard for the CARES Act and the subsequent extensions of PSP. And we did so in close partnership with lawmakers from both parties and in lockstep with our labor union partners. The PSP shows what can be accomplished through bipartisanship and compromise. And all those who were involved in crafting the program deserve a great deal of credit. When the CARES Act passed, we understood that receiving financial support from the federal government comes with an obligation to serve. It was an obligation we were ready, willing, and humbled to accept, and we are very proud of how, our, of how our team has delivered. Thanks to PSP, we have the team in place that we need to run our airlines successfully. In fact, at American Airlines, we have as many or more pilots and flight attendants per scheduled crew block hour this year as we've had in years preceding the pandemic. So with our team at the ready, we've been able to run a safe and reliable airline and continue providing critical air service, including to small and rural, rural communities. As I've outlined in my written testimony, American Airlines and all U.S. carriers are delivering on our commitments with an overall operational performance this year that is as good or better than before the pandemic. Not only has American performed well, we've done so while growing back at an unprecedented pace. We grew by an industry leading 82% from the first quarter to the second quarter of this year, and we are providing significantly more service to the flying public than any of our competitors. We took that aggressive approach because the central purpose of PSP was to ensure we were able to provide air service when, when travelers decided they were ready to get back to flying. In addition to the strong year-to-date operational performance I mentioned, I'm also pleased to say 
that American delivered a stellar performance over the Thanksgiving travel period, and we're off to a great start in December as we look, as we look toward the upcoming holidays. I'm extremely proud of how our team has stepped up as demand has rebounded. They've shown tremendous professionalism and dedication to the customers we've had the privilege to care for. Now, like other airlines and numerous other businesses, we have experienced some operational challenges in recent months, which, have worked to, we, which we've worked to manage as deftly as possible and with the utmost care for our customers and our team. While various pandemic-related factors have caused our operation to run tight when extraordinary disruptions occur, these events have been the distinct exception, not the rule. A strong U.S. airline industry has been and will continue to be critical to the overall economic recovery from COVID-19. Because of your leadership, U.S. airlines are competing vigorously. Fares have remained low, and we are doing our part as an industry to support the ongoing economic recovery. Indeed, according to the DOT, the average domestic itinerary fare in 2019 was the lowest inflation-adjusted annual fare on record, and fares have declined further yet in 2020 and 2021. So in summary, I am incredibly proud of how the American Airlines team has managed through the pandemic. Early on, we agreed that this one day would pass. And what would matter most is how we treated each other, our customers, and those in our care. Looking back, I'm extremely proud of the decisions we made and of the values we use to guide us. And on a personal note, I have been humbled by the thousands of American Airlines team members who have thanked me for fighting for their jobs. So it gives me tremendous pleasure today to pass those thanks along to you. So thank you for your support of our team, for all you've done to protect the vitality of our industry. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Mr. Kelly, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the committee. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Gary Kelly, and I'm very privileged to serve as the chairman and CEO at Southwest Airlines. So thank you for inviting me to testify here on behalf of the more than 54,000 Southwest employees who directly benefited from the payroll support program. And I can sum up the PSP in two words. It worked. Our employees have endured unprecedented challenges over the last two years, from new federal requirements to unruly passengers, but I couldn't be more proud of them for their resilience and their resolve. They're nothing short of heroic. And PSP secured their jobs and their pay and their benefits. So I wanna start by expressing my heartfelt appreciation to you all and to members of Congress and certainly uh, this committee. In a bipartisan fashion, Congress recognized the severity of the COVID-19 threat and heeded the call for swift, decisive action. And passing the PSP within weeks, despite this incredible achievement, no one could have predicted what happened in the months that followed. Multiple waves of COVID cases, new COVID-19 variants, changes in government policies, volatile demand for air travel, and record financial losses for every single airline. Even with the turbulence that was brought on by the global pandemic, your commitment to protecting the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of airline workers never wavered. And most importantly, you saw the PSP as a successful program worthy of not one, but two extensions. And for that, on behalf of all Southwest Airlines, I'm eternally grateful. In Southwest, we take pride in being a maverick, including being about as well prepared for this crisis as any company, let alone any airline, can be. And looking back at early 2020, we entered the pandemic in a strong financial position. We had over $5 billion in liquidity. We had very modest debt. We had record low financial leverage and a low cost structure. As the pandemic unfolded, we took aggressive and appropriate self-help measures to remain solvent eliminating discretionary spending, right-sizing our flight schedule, and cutting executive compensation. At the same time, Southwest has never achieved our low cost on the backs of our employees. We're 83% unionized. We offer industry-leading retirement and health benefits. We're consistently ranked on Fortune's list of the world's most admired companies and Glassdoor's list of best places to work. And until 2020, our employees receive profit sharing contributions each and every year since 1972, which is an unprecedented streak of profits of 47 years. So for Southwest, the source of our strength and success is our people. 
and they've always been my top priority and my number one concern is our employees' health and job security. And funds received through the PSP were only used for qualifying employee salaries, wages, and benefits. We did not cut pay rates. We did not cut hours. We did not cut benefits. We did not lay off, and we did not furlough. We actually have raised our employees' pay. And my biggest source of pride is that Southwest has never had an involuntary layoff or furlough in our 50-year history. Southwest is also the only major airline to maintain service at every domestic airport that we serve before the pandemic. And moreover, in the last 22 months, we launched service to 18 new airports. It's also a testament to our people that we've been the best year-to-date DOT customer satisfaction ranking among marketing carriers and the highest net promoter score in the industry. By every measure, we lived up to the letter and the spirit of the PSP as Congress intended. Our operational performance during the week of Thanksgiving underscores our focus on reliability, and we knew the challenges um, of a busy holiday season and week might bring and implemented several enhancements to support our customers and our employees. And in a week where we served over 2 million customers, we operated nearly 24,000 flights with a 99.9% .9 completion rate and only 12 cancellations. Our DOT on-time performance for the week was 88.3%, and on November the 28th, 2021's busiest travel day based on the TSA numbers, Southwest had the highest on-time performance in the industry. So in closing, I'm extremely proud of our company's record of taking care of our employees and our customers and the communities that we serve. As I've said to many in the past year, it was messy going into this pandemic. It's gonna be messy coming out. Uh, but for as long as the pandemic persists, we'll continue to be cautious and focused on reliability and I assure you that no matter what challenge is presented to us next, taking care of our employees and our customers remains Southwest's primary goal. So thank you all again for your tremendous support during our darkest hours as a company and as an industry, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you so much for that testimony. We'll now turn to Mr. Kirby. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss United Airlines' response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the payroll support program's assistance to companies like United. On behalf of all the United employees and our industry, I'd like to thank Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Wicker, and all the members of this committee and the federal government for your support during the most challenging time in our shared history. As I begin, I also want to publicly thank our 80,000 United employees who have performed so admirably and worked so tirelessly throughout this pandemic to take care of our customers and each other. Our United team in the airports, on board our aircraft, and all throughout our global network have been on the front lines of this crisis from day one and helped ensure anyone or anything, including medical equipment and vaccines, who needed to travel throughout the pandemic could do so safely. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most disruptive crisis in the history of commercial aviation, with both a devastating human and economic toll. The quick response by the federal government with the rapid implementation of the PSP prevented what would have been an unprecedented shutdown of air service that would have impacted the U.S. and world economy for years to come. The PSP allowed us to maintain operational consistency, avoiding the challenges that shutdowns, mass involuntary layoffs, and furloughs would have created. United supplemented the federal support with our own unprecedented cost-cutting and fundraising efforts. PSP also gave us the time and the bridge to the private capital markets, where we raised an additional $23 billion in debt. At the same time we were shoring up our finances, we were also taking early and aggressive action to mitigate the impact of the virus on our employees and our customers. We led on safety throughout the crisis. We were the first airline and amongst the first companies to require masks last April. And this August, we implemented our vaccine requirement well ahead of any government directive for the sole and simple reason that we believed it was the right thing to do for safety. Today, we remain the first and only airline to successfully complete a vaccination requirement for employees. We also learned, leaned into our responsibility to keep the country and the world connected. We operated more than 130 repatriation flights, brought home more than 18,000 stranded Americans, booked close to 3,000 free flights for medical volunteers and transported hundreds of millions of pounds of medical kits, PPE, and medical equipment. And United continues to fly vaccines around the world, 
We've already flown over 400 million vaccines since they were first ready for distribution. Throughout the pandemic, United and many members of Congress worked closely with our unions, and I want to recognize and thank the Airline Pilots Association, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, the Association of Flight Attendants, and the Professional Airline Flight Control Association. The PSP not only kept the airline running, but it also kept the economy moving during a time of great uncertainty. As customers began to fly again, we took a gradual approach to building back our schedule. We knew it would be challenging to try to bring flights back all at once and too quickly, so we made the conscious decision to gradually add capacity over time. While this choice sacrificed short-term profits, it allowed us to ensure a reliable service and to largely avoid any widespread operational impacts to our customers. But even in the depth of the crisis, we always kept an eye on the future for customers we invested in technologies and enacted new policies to make travel easier and more enjoyable. We got rid of change fees forever for travel within the U.S. We're investing in features like large overhead bins, seatback entertainment, and fast Wi-Fi, and our mobile app was the first to let customers check their destination's travel requirements, schedule COVID-19 tests, and upload and validate vaccine records using artificial intelligence. From an employment perspective, we've already hired more than 5,000 people this year into careers with high pay and benefits, and expect to hire approximately 10,000 more next year. And for the, our communities, United is the leading global airline in the fight against climate change. We're leading in sustainable aviation fuels, electric aircraft, and hydrogen aircraft, just to name a few. While the COVID-19 pandemic has been the most disruptive global crisis in the history of aviation, United is emerging as a leader and as a better airline for our customers and employees. The payroll support program was a vital aid when our industry and our employees needed it most. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this committee and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Lochter. Good afternoon, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and discuss the status of the U.S. airline industry during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is John Lauder and I have the privilege of serving as Delta's Executive Vice President and Chief of Operations. I've been with Delta for over 28 years, serving in several leadership positions. I look forward to sharing the measures Delta has taken to address the crisis by protecting the health of our customers and the safety and jobs of our people, who have done an outstanding job throughout the pandemic. I also look forward to discussing our compliance with the payroll support programs. Currently, I'm responsible for ensuring that we provide safe, reliable, industry-leading operations across the globe. I directly oversee Delta's global flying operations, maintenance services, and safety and security groups, over 22,000 Delta professionals. Delta and all of its employees are extremely grateful to this committee and the rest of the U.S. Congress for your support throughout the pandemic. The pandemic has reminded us all the importance of cooperation and taking care of one another in our community. I'm so proud of how the Delta team pulled together for each other and for our customers during this time. In the early days of the pandemic, demand for air travel evaporated by nearly 95%, forcing Delta to take decisive action to preserve jobs without compromising on employee and customer safety. We parked or retired more than 650 aircraft and consolidated facilities at airports nationwide. We cut executive compensation, and more than 40,000 employees volunteered for unpaid leaves of absences. The Delta community truly came together during an extraordinarily stressful and difficult time. Delta people led the way in demonstrating our commitment to health and safety. We moved quickly at the onset of the pandemic to transform the industry standard of cleanliness to ensure a safe and comfortable travel experience for our customers and employees. In the span of a few months, we implemented a rigorous cleaning regimen on board our aircraft and in all of our facilities, a broad employee COVID testing program, the industry's first mask requirement, contact tracing on international flights, and other pandemic protocols that have protected the safety of our customers and employees. In the past year, we spent over $25 million to administer more than 151,000 vaccines, not only to Delta people, but to friends, families, and members of the Georgia community and across the country. As we continue to face challenges presented by COVID, we are committed to maintaining our tradition of excellent customer service. Delta has long run the most reliable operation in the world, and we've maintained that standard in the recovery. 
And I'd like to be clear on, on this point. This year, we are exceeding our operational performance compared to 2019 and lead the industry in on-time performance and completion factor. We're in the process of hiring thousands of new Delta people and regrowing our network in a disciplined way that allows us to deliver on our commitments to our people and our customers. The unmatched level of service culminated in the best customer feedback scores we've ever received, earning us the number one spot on the 2021 J.D. Power North American Airline Satisfaction Study. I would like to once again thank Congress for the invaluable support the payroll support program was to us. To ensure that we're in full compliance with the terms of the PSP agreements, Delta established a PSP and CARES Act Compliance Steering Committee and CARES Act Working Group. These groups made up of our law, compliance, HR, and finance teams uh, focused on adhering the PSP requirements to ensure these critical funds were used only for eligible employee wages, salaries, and benefits could be a prop properly accounted for and continue to ensure strict compliance with ongoing program restrictions. Together with the extraordinary efforts of our employees, these PSP funds helped us save jobs. As we recover from the pandemic, we will continue to keep the health and safety of our customers and employees our top priority. Thank you again for your support of the airline industry, and more importantly, thank you for your support of our people. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> and last but certainly not least, uh, uh, Ms. Nelson, thank you for your voice in all of this. It's been a very important one. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Wicker, and members of the committee. I'm a 25-year union flight attendant, and just five years into my career, I witnessed personal and national tragedy with the events of September 11, 2001. As a Boston-based flight attendant, I lost nine friends on Flight 175, the day aviation in our country came to a total stop. Within weeks, half of my flight attendant base was furloughed. The federal government response was a $5 billion compensation for direct losses incurred across the whole industry as a result of the ground stop ordered by the government. And I'm quoting from the Air Transportation Stabilization Act of 2001. It also included a loan guarantee program that the White House denied for United Airlines, even after employees agreed to significant concessions as a part of the condition of the loan. The result of insufficient action from the government was a string of bankruptcies across the industry. We were the bailout. Our jobs were cut, our pensions were gutted, those who remained shouldered massive pay cuts and many more hours on the job. Wall Street was ecstatic with the enormous cuts to labor costs. Workers were devastated. Consumers eventually felt the hit too as capacity was cut, seat size shrunk, and pricing became segmented with all kinds of fees. There was no hiring for a long time, but the diminished jobs later made it hard to attract pilots, mechanics, and other aviation careers. So when air travel demand dropped overnight in March of 2020, we refused to follow the old blank check for corporations bailout playbook, especially for airlines. We designed what, could later, what would later be called the payroll support program and took it to Chairman Peter DeFazio in the House. When the airlines asked him for help, he demanded that they talk to labor first, and that's what they did. American CEO Doug Parker called me on March 18th, and I went to A4A headquarters where all of the CEOs were camped out and frustrated with the response from the days of meetings on the Hill. I was honest with them. I said, the public is mad at you and feeling the sting of inequality on our planes. You're not going to get anything on your own, but if you work with labor and support our Workers First program, we can save the industry. We didn't agree on every provision that night, but the basic terms of the program were set, and the next day we started working together to get it done. Senator Cantwell and Senator Wicker, with your leadership, I cannot thank you enough. In less than a week, the PSP program became a part of the CARES Act and our jobs were saved. I have to recognize the outstanding leadership of Leader Schumer as well. We kept our health care, our retirement, and kept paying taxes. We didn't stress unemployment lines or need coverage for costly COBRA benefits. The Workers First Relief Program saved millions of ancillary jobs connected to the industry and made it possible to restart our economy. Consumers haven't faced in inflation in the cost of airline tickets because we were positioned to meet demand and companies were required to use the funds for payroll. The program helped workers, helped airlines, and helped consumers. 
while capping executive pay, you're welcome, guys, and banning stock buybacks and dividends. For the first time in American history, a relief program told companies exactly how they had to apply the relief. The required service they must maintain for the country and insured federal dollars got directly to the people and to the taxpayers. Some have questioned the use of the relief dollars in the wake of operational meltdowns in late summer and fall. This wasn't related to PSP. It was the result of, first, the lapse in PSP funding from October 1st, 2020 to December 28th, 2020, as we warned would happen due to the backlog in retraining, certification, and security credentials that are needed. And airlines planned operation based on pre-pandemic overtime hours, but workers were no longer willing to pick up voluntary overtime at the same rate because of combative passengers and COVID concerns. But recognizing these issues, unions negotiated with management before Thanksgiving to put in place the financial incentives for crew to pick up time, and it worked. Airline performance was off the charts over the Thanksgiving holiday travel week. PSP made it possible to meet demand. Now, we are not a bailout, but lately we have been punching bags. Flight attendants and aviation workers are saying, please make it stop. My written testimony provides a series of recommendations to address this, starting with clear communication and swift consequences for violent offenders. I'd especially like to call your attention to the U.S. Attorney General's memorandum calling for an interagency coordination to address criminal conduct on commercial flights. We urge the Department of Justice to ensure arrest and prosecution of disruptive passengers on the plane and in the airport. Failing to ensure consequences for passengers who prevent passenger service agents from doing their jobs by assaulting, intimidating, or threatening them on the ground only increases the likelihood of problems in the air too. This pandemic has been brutal, and we're not through it yet. But no one should question the effectiveness of the Aviation Payroll Support Program. It was the most transparent program in all of COVID relief. It is being declared the best relief program put in place anywhere around the world, and should be the model for future relief in all industries. PSP not only addressed the crisis, it made it possible for us to ensure we lose no time in getting back to the urgent issues we faced prior to the pandemic. Safety, security, worker and consumer rights, improving aviation jobs, diversity and inclusion, sustainability, implementing next-gen technology, and so much more. We are so grateful for the bipartisan efforts of this committee to enact PSP. It worked. Thank you for your continued oversight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson, and thank you for uh, raising two important issues. For, I uh, have worked with Senator Durbin on making sure the Department of Justice does address those issues. It is intolerable, and, and I hope the Department of Justice will uh, uh, prosecute those cases. Secondly, I think it's safe to say if there's 100 members of the United States Senate, there were 100 different opinions exactly how this program worked, but in the end, uh, people made compromise and worked together to get something, so thank you for for, for mentioning that. Um, w this hearing is part of an official report that we are going to do, so we won't get to every question today. We're not going to, but there will be questions for the record too, so if something you know, isn't asked today, we will be following up. But there are a couple of things, we've talked about all the positive aspects. There's a couple of things people want to know about the hiccups along the way. Um, obviously last, uh, uh, I think it was probably July, August, we ran into some things. I think that, that was on my chart of like, we were way above everybody else returning to service. But uh, if if the, we sent out letters asking airlines who had problems to tell us what those were about, if, if anybody, if you're one of those airlines and you want to comment, if you could give us a comment on that. Um, and then also on refunds, um, if we can just get a quick answer from people. I'm assuming that all airlines believe that if you were uh, someone who wanted to travel during that period and your flight was canceled and then something happened and where you didn't want to travel, that you could get a refund. And so if you could just also give me a comment on that. So do you want to start, Mr. Pachter? Sure. Um, on the end of October, we had American had a serious operational issue. Um, it was it was driven by an extraordinary event, uh, winds at Dallas Fort Worth of all places that shut down three of the five runways, our largest hub. Um, when that happens over two days, uh, we end up with airplanes in the wrong place, people in the wrong place. 
Um, so that was, the, that was the driver of the vast majority of the cancellations. But, we, but in this environment, even though we are adequately staffed, it, it gets characterized, it gets unfortunately uncharacterized, and it misproperly characterized, as we don't have enough people. Um, as I said in my testimony, we have more pilots per pilot block hour, flight attendants per flight attendant block hour than we've, than we've had in the past. Uh, what, in this environment, unfortunately though, it's difficult to get people to pick up extra, extra time, uh, is what we're finding, so it, which is what we need in that time. Uh, and that was the case there. It's largely related to what Ms. Ms. Nelson said uh, about um, some of what's going on in the aircraft. Uh, it's related to COVID, but we we just didn't have the we don't have the ability to recover as quickly. Um, now, fortunately, those those large events don't happen very often. Um, but when they do, uh, at least for us, we've had it much much harder to recover than we had in the past. So it extended longer than it would have otherwise. It was a, it was a seriously. Um, disruptive event that would have resulted in hundreds of cancellations on its own. Uh, the fact that it took two days longer, uh, we were troubled by, but that's the reason why we have, we have, we really do have difficulty um, versus um, prior to the pandemic right now. I think that'll pass, by the way, um, but this is the environment we're in right now. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different job than people have been working. Uh, we've called people back from leaves that were on leave that didn't, that weren't ready to be called back from leave. Um, so people are doing a great job, a phenomenal job, showing up, doing their jobs, doing it right. But when we need, you know, extra hours, working by the minimum hours, it's harder to find. Uh, so that was our that was our case. As to refunds, uh, of course, we agree exactly what you said. Um, and indeed, we at American issued $3.2 billion of refunds in 2020 in three quarters of 2020. And our revenues over the last three quarters of 2020 was $7.5 billion. We issued nearly as much in refunds as we had in revenue, or, or half as much, rather, over, over the three quarters. This is in refunds versus uh, a, um, you know, a voucher or something. Yeah, absolute cash refunds, $3.2 okay. billion. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we, we took the position that you stated, which is um, if, it's, if, if, there, if we cancel a flight, of course, the customer's entitled to a refund, and we issued those in cash. Okay. Others? Yeah, yeah. My my report is, is very similar, and um, it, it's it's a matter of getting adjusted to, I think, uh, you know, this uh, pandemic reality that we're all dealing with, and uh, uh, we're just we just need to make sure that we don't overschedule the airline relative to the people resources that we have, and we've made um, uh, a number of adjustments uh, in that regard, uh, but much much for the same reasons that uh, Doug was uh, describing there. Um, the, uh, yeah, refunds, um, yeah, that, that, the refunds are uh, obviously required uh, when we cancel the flight. Uh, refunds are required uh, within seven days of, uh, of, of uh, the uh, need for the refund, and we're totally in compliance with that. Uh, our refund rate in 2020 was double uh, what was normal, even though the revenues were a fraction of what they were historically. So um, I feel like, you know, we, we've taken very good care of our customers in that regard. Okay. I'm going to have to get the rest of you for the record because my time is up. But I, I do want everybody to, to address that issue, including the airlines that aren't here. And if they can, you know, give us uh, answers in writing for that, that would be great. Senator Wicker. Uh, thank you very much. Let me ask um, about air quality. Uh, Mr. Lauder, in your testimony, you say, we continue to electrostatically spray our aircraft interiors with high-grade disinfectant and use HEPA air filters to remove 99.99% .99 of airborne particles on board. Um, is, is this new or were those HEPA filters there all along? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, I, th those are HEPA filters that are part of an aircraft circulation system, and I would assume that um, our, all modern airliners have those same systems. Okay, so th they were there to start with. That is correct. But and, and you have partnered, I believe, with Mayo Clinic. That is correct. Perhaps other airlines uh, uh, did something similar with uh, the top experts in the world on healthcare. What do they tell you about the quality of uh, air with respect to the virus uh, as compared to, say, a theater, uh, a church, a concert hall, perhaps a hearing room? Uh, <laughs> what do they tell you? Uh, Senator, I, you're right. We, we did partner with some science experts such as the Mayo Clinic. And part of the discussion on the HEPA filters on board the aircraft was to understand what that air turnover rate was and, and how uh, the, the air quality on board the aircraft would compare 
to other facilities. And I can't speak to this room or, or um, any theater, but I think we all generally agree now that, uh, that the cycle of the way air turns over in a pressurized air cabin and the filtration system um, is superior to many indoor spaces that you can be. Okay, who else from the airline industry would like to speak to that? Mr. Kirby? Yeah, United. thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. Um, and at United, we partnered with the Cleveland Clinic uh, as our expert partner, but we also partnered with DARPA and the Department of Defense back in May of last year. There was a great story about why is United Airlines airplanes flying circles out over the Atlantic Ocean, um, and it was because the Department of Defense was testing the airflow on airplanes. Um, and the conclusion of that is that effectively anywhere that you're going to be indoors, the airplane is the safest place that you can be indoors. It's because of the air filtration. Safer than a theater, safer than a theater. Far safer than a theater. Far safer actually than an intensive care unit because we have HEPA grade filters, but we filter the air 20 to 30 times an hour and a typical ICU is two to three times an hour. Uh, aircraft are a remarkably safe environment. The, the takeaway that I remember most is that being next to someone on an airplane, sitting next to them, is the equivalent of being 15 feet away from them in a typical building. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. Kirby. Do you think your airline's better than Mr. Lauder's, Mr. Kelly's, and Mr. Parker's? <laughs> well, of course I do. I'm, I'm I think we've all I'm done the same the thing for safety. <laughs> I, um, let me ask Mr. Kelly, on, on, the, on the air quality, and, and Mr. Parker, would both of you briefly comment on that? And would we ever, do you think, be able to get on an airplane without masks. Well, again, I would, I would echo uh, my colleague's comments uh, on the quality of the air. It's, uh, the, the statistics I recall is 99.97% of airborne pathogens uh, are captured by the HEPA filtering system and it's turned over every two or three minutes. We use UT Southwestern and Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, so uh, we just add to this prestigious list. But um, yeah, I, I think the case uh, is very strong that uh, masks don't add much, if anything, uh, in the uh, air cabin environment. It's very safe and very high quality com compared to uh, uh, any other indoor setting. Mr. Parker. Uh, I, I concur. The, air, the aircraft is the safest place you can be. Um, it's true of all of our aircraft. They all have these HEPA filters and the same airflow. Um, okay. Ms. Nelson, will, will we ever uh, be able not to wear masks in them? I think that that's probably for the medical community to decide rather than me. But what I will add is that the studies that were done that have been referenced were also done with mannequins who were sitting straight forward with masks on, not removing them, not eating at any point in time. Um, so it is, it is important to recognize that the um, safe, controlled environment on the plane is a layered uh, safety protocol, which includes the sanitation of the aircraft, it includes the service procedures, it includes the HEPA filtration that are not on all aircraft, by the way, and it includes everyone wearing the masks. So the, the filtration system um, is different from airline to airline or from aircraft? From aircraft to aircraft. So not all aircraft have the HEPA filtration. Older, older planes may not. The flights that you take to Mississippi, for example. I'm, they're the best. <laughs> they're the best. Well, they're the uh, best. Mr. Kelly, that's what you told me. <laughs> but on your Southwest flights, Mr. Lauder, okay. On, on your <laughs> Southwest flights, I don't want. I don't want to get in the middle of that. But I, I, what I will tell you is, we absolutely look forward to the day that we no longer have the mask requirement, and um, we are simply trying to get through this pandemic and have had to enforce this to keep everyone safe. Not everyone on our planes have had access to the vaccine yet either. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, Senator Schatz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Thank you to all of you for being here. I really appreciate it. And um, we've all come through difficult times. We're probably not quite done with all of that, but I do appreciate uh, every single one of your uh, leadership. I want to start with Ms. Nelson. Um, I know you elucidated in your testimony, but if you could, uh, f for the committee, just summarize what are the key recommendations that you have for passenger safety and for crew safety um, going forward, and tell us what we should tell Pete Buttigieg to get on top of. 
Okay, so the, the biggest issue is um, making sure that we're very clear about what the consequences are if someone is acting out. So it's very, we are very heartened to know that FAA and DOJ are working together now, sharing information, and we are moving forward with criminal prosecution. When we got the fines and penalties in place in early 2000, and then that was implemented, and this was reported out through the media, by 2008, 2009, events of air rage incidents on planes was going down in the US while it was still going up around the world. So we know that those consequences are a good deterrent. Um, we also need to be very clear from the time that people get into the airport until they leave the airport again on the other side of their trip uh, about what the rules are, uh, what the consequences are, and, and what we'll do if they don't, they don't comply. We do need more enforcement in the airports because we are not seeing that happen, and it is unclear um, who is responsible for that at TSA and how uh, uh, consistently that is happening. We need to ban to-go alcohol. This is a major issue. And alcohol is being uh, pushed on passengers now, today, more so after, as we are in the pandemic than before. This started with to-go alcohol because of pandemic serving procedures, and they determined that this was a money maker, and they are pushing it now in the airports. And that is unacceptable because it is at the expense of our safety. So we would hope that that would stop. And um, those are the key items. Uh, we also we just want to make sure that there is attention on uh, the issues at the gate as much as they are on the plane because 50% of the events, our members tell us they were able to identify there was a problem in the gate. If we had clear attention on that and had law, law enforcement response, we'd cut down on half of the events on the plane right there. As someone who flies as much as a flight attendant, the, um, all of those are my, my personal observations as well, anecdotal as they may be. Uh, Mr. Kirby, I, I want to first of all thank you for your leadership on the climate issue. Thank you. Um, you said on a panel this year, we've had a couple of conversations about climate, and, and you've said some tough stuff about offsets. And so um, uh, earlier this year, you said they're a fig leaf for a CEO who wants to write a check, a check, check the box, pretend they've done the right thing. I, I tend to agree. Um, I know this is a little bit of a love fest, but I think it's important uh, for us to talk about offsets. Yeah. Um, I get aviation's hard. You're in the business of, of using jet fuel to move people around the planet. And so as we make our climate transformation, you may be some of the, the, the laggards and not because you don't desire to move, but because we, we don't really have an alternative to jet fuel. Um, so could you talk about A, what you think about offsets, and B, what's the future yeah. of, of transportation as it relates to climate action? Well, uh, thank you, Senator. They're related. And as you know, uh, as many of you know, um, this is a personal passion for mine, and United is, is trying to make a real difference in the world on climate change. For aviation, we are a hard to decarbonize industry, but it's important that we keep flying people. You know, one of the casualties of COVID was the loss of connectivity around the world. When we have thousands of people flying to another country every day, back and forth, those bridges help bring us together and they got torn apart during COVID. So we need to keep flying, but do it responsibly. Sustainable aviation fuel is the number one thing for this industry and we need your help, your support. In the Build Back Better bill, there's a portion of it um, regardless of what happens with the overall bill, the blender's tax credit, that's the most important thing that can happen to really build that industry. Uh, that's gonna be big for us. On your point about climate, or about carbon offsets, traditional carbon offsets, um, I've been passionate about this for 30 years and I hated it because the fact of the matter is most of them aren't real. Um, they're planting trees that were gonna be planted anyway or not cutting down trees that were not gonna be cut down anyway. But even if that isn't the case, if we took this is, comes from Yale. If we took all the space on the planet where you could plant trees and planted them all with trees, um, it's less than five months of mankind's emissions, and it's a one-shot solution. Um, and because of that, we will not make a dent in climate change if every corporation, this isn't unique to aviation, if every corporation is focused on the easy answer, let's plant trees in order to solve climate change. We need real things like sustainable aviation fuel, carbon sequestration, if we had more time, I'd talk about that, as you know. Um, but we need real solutions like that. Um, this is a solvable problem. It's not easy. We can solve it, but we gotta be real about what the answers are. I have two questions for the record. Uh, the first will be about minimum seat size, uh, and the, the second will be about a, uh, an in-flight video that used to be in every seat back coming into the state of Hawaii to basically educate people. I know under, under the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution, we can't prevent people from coming to the state of Hawaii, but we can tell people how to be a good guest. 
And right now, that is a clickable option, which nobody clicks. And particularly bad guests are not going to be the ones that click. I have tried to work with A4A uh, A to get this to be mandatory content. I'll be reducing my request to writing to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Blunt, I, I, Senator Klobuchar had been on the screen, so we're going to go to her afterwards if she's available. But Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Kirby, when um, we may see how far this question go with others, but when you were getting ready to get back to significant numbers of passengers in the air and in the airport, what were the things you were the most concerned about that you didn't control? Uh, you know, one of the things we did that was unique at United in April of last year, we thought the pandemic might last a couple of years. And because of that, we put a team together that really their goal was to identify landmines of things that if this lasts for a few years, and mostly there were small things like badging at airports, um, you know, the badging office, make sure they were appropriately staffed. Um, the things that we worried about the most were really the unanticipated because we had a list of hundreds of things. We could look through all of those. Um, the challenges that we've had have been, we've had challenges too. We've avoided big operational disruptions, but the challenges uh, have mostly been around things uh, that, that happened from vendors that support all of us. So there was fuel shortages um, in the West this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, airports, that, that wasn't even on our list, and we had a long list uh, as an example. But those kinds of shortages with people that we depend on, infrastructure that we depend on and kind of took for granted, um, that wasn't ready to come back at 100% as soon as we were. Mr. Lauder, do you have anything on that question? Um, I, I would only add that you know, similarly, as we were getting ready for the return, we, we formed a team of operational readiness. And, um, and part of what we were looking at is, is what other pieces of the aviation puzzle well, we, should we just be having the same conversation with? And that included several um, uh, government entities, such as the FAA, air traffic controllers, uh, CBP, and TSA. And, and largely, um, as we co did that coordination, we found um, that they were having similar conversations. So a lot of those were the things that we went through in addition to some of the supply chain issues Mr. Kirby mentioned. Well, Ms. Nelson, on that same topic, were there things from a flight attendant perspective that um, you would have expected to be ready when you got back to numbers of passengers? And you mentioned already the, uh, the, the concerns about putting people on the plane that it's obvious in the airport they shouldn't be on the plane. Any other things like that you've seen? Um, we, <laughs> our, our biggest issue right now actually is this pushing of alcohol in the airport and then the inconsistency with the enforcement so that people are not really sure what to believe. Part of the problem that we have seen is that as people are boarding at different airports, some of the um, patchwork of policies around the nation about what people should be doing has led people to believe that that they don't know what to believe. And keeping people in a constant state like that is, is really unsettling. And so I would liken it to when we have a delay and we've got all the passengers on the plane, in the times when we are giving regular updates about what's going on and we're being honest with people, they leave that plane smiling and happy. When we don't do that, they are very angry. And that is what we have seen during the pandemic with the, with the different policies and the different communications. That, and that has been, uh, I think, added to the issues at the airport. All right, thank you. Mr. Parker, you mentioned earlier that uh, you thought you had the right number of people but you didn't have the right number of people at the right time. Why, why would that be? People, you know, well, the right number of people if everybody's well and showing up? Right number of people if we don't have an enormous disruption, um, if we don't have a significant disruption. In those events, um, those, you know, we, we need people to want to pick up additional trips um, and to work more than just their minimums. That's the situation. Um, very rare that it happens, uh, but it happened to us in late October. But that's really the situation. In, in normal weather events, this isn't about, it, it doesn't have to be perfect weather. We have enough people to run the airline. We have enough people to run the airline in, in any sort of, um, you know, hurricanes or anything like that we could handle. Um, but when we had this unforecasted situation in Dallas, we just, we, we're, it's very difficult to get people to essentially not really volunteer for work, but to be there to pick up additional trips when needed. Now, this may be more of a societal question than, a, than a, just an airline question, but did you have more people, did you think people were more willing to take extra time before the pandemic than after the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. And again, but, but again, I'm not trying to make a statement about our people. Uh, it's, it's largely related to the pandemic, I believe. So, again, some of the things Ms. Neville talked about uh, makes it hard for flight attendants to want to, be, to go to work more than they have to. 
Um, but also, yeah, it, it's there is there is a pan, there is a global pandemic going on. So it's anyway, our our team's doing a great job. We just find it harder uh, in those circumstances than it has been in the past. Mr. Uh, Kelly, I, I see Miss Nelson shaking her head. Yes, did you see this? Do you have do you have same situation two years ago? Would you have had people more eager to sign up for? Over time, than it's, you yeah, it's a very different environment, and uh, I don't talk to uh, a CEO without having you know similar experiences uh, shared. So it's a difficult hiring environment, as we all know. There's a lot of people out of the workforce, and then um, uh, I, I think even within uh, Doug mentioned earlier, just having people returning from leaves three weeks makes a habit. They're out for a long time. Uh, they may not be interested in working as much, uh, as an example. Sarah mentioned the same thing. So yes, I think we're all experiencing that. Absenteeism is higher. Uh, we have more people on leave. Attrition is a little bit higher. So for most categories, it's not that they're remarkably different, but when you add them all together, yeah, it's, it's just a different working environment. We're adjusting to it. Uh, and um, I think one of the things that we're anxious to do is restore um, flight activity within our network where it was before. And uh, obviously one of the supply chain constraints we have is just uh, getting people on board to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Senator Catwell. I'm here uh, chairing a hearing on antitrust and innovation, so I'm, I'm uh, pleased to be on remotely. Um, um, why don't we start with, with you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, uh, you talk about in your testimony how Southwest uh, maintained service to all the domestic airports um, that you served before the pandemic. Could you talk about how the um, PSP helped Southwest achieve this? Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Great to see you. Um, I think it, it was uh, simply being able to keep all of our airplanes, keep all of our people, and then be in a position where we can uh, respond to uh, demand as it, as it returns. So during the pandemic, um, in the darkest days when revenues were down 95%, obviously um, we didn't need to be flying a lot of empty airplanes around. So we reduced uh, our flight activity there, but um, we had opportunities to add uh, with available aircraft. We had opportunities to add uh, more new cities and we're delighted to see that we had a lot of good opportunities to do that. They were more leisure oriented because uh, business travel uh, still lags dramatically uh, what it was pre-pandemic. But uh, Thank you. ESP required, Thank you. provided the uh, funds to be Thank able you. to sustain that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Mr. Parker, you and I met uh, yesterday. We talked about just overall the workforce shortage issues um, and uh, talk about uh, in a minute here. Um, um, including airplane mechanics. What do you think we need to do in Washington to improve that? Uh, well, thanks, Senator. Uh, and uh, yes, it's, it's a, we, have, we have a number of jobs like this, mechanic jobs, pilot jobs, that are great jobs uh, that uh, unfortunately um, are, we, we could do a much better job of providing the, tr of, 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 as a country, uh, making it easier for people to get the training necessary uh, to do those jobs. And um, we certainly would like to work with you more on that I think I think all of us have ideas on things that can be done, uh, but this is uh, this is a this is a workforce issue that is um, ripe to be addressed, and one that I know that if we work together, we can get addressed. Excellent, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Lauder. Um, uh, Senator Blunt, who just spoke, he and I lead the bill on led, led the bill for a while on Brand USA, which is really important uh, to allow our country to advertise in other countries. Obviously, the pandemic has. Um, and allow us to partner with the private sector to do that, and not at the expense of taxpayers, uh, but to great gain uh, for tourism. Um, could you talk about, despite the pandemic, how hard this has been, um, how important international travel is to our country in terms of not just the airlines, but really our entire tourism network? Well, Senator, thank you for that question. I, um, I, I would say, uh, though it's extremely important, and it's the segment of our business recovery um, that is lagging the most. So we are excited to see uh, and, and very encouraged by the changes uh, uh, to our, our border opening. Um, and I think that that going forward is one of the most important things that we can do, is ensure that we keep the border open 
We keep the process for crossing the border simple, and we work on making it consistent and easy within whatever those requirements are, be it vaccinations or tests or things like that. So I think, uh, you know, that piece yep. of our international business recovery is key. All right, thank you. Um, and I'll, maybe you can comment on Brand USA later on the record if anyone else wants to do that, because it's pretty important to the tourism industry. Everyone, anyone want to join in here? No one? Okay. Hi, Senator Grassley. I'm on live in the commerce hearing. You want to say hello? <laughs> um, now uh, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Ms. Nelson. Okay. Uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, you uh, referred to the flight attendants as you sometimes sadly can be punching bags um, uh, when there are disruptive passengers. Could you quickly give your ideas on how you can um, get at that? And what are some of the policy changes you think would help? Yes, thank you, uh, Senator Klobuchar. So uh, we definitely need um, clear consequences. So we're happy to see that DOJ is taking this as a serious step and the instruction from um, President Biden to do that. Um, we also need to address any of the issues that are uh, that are contributing to this, such as alcohol, which is our members tell us are about 60% of the incidents. So we're trying to cut the to-go alcohol in the airports. And we need clear communications throughout, throughout the entire process. So, um, and um, coordinated response from law enforcement and FBI so that we have consistent response at the gates and, and that co those consequences can be levied. Um, so these are, the, these are the holes that we're trying to plug. And I do want to recognize that we have been working with the airlines on this. And there have been absolute um, advancements by working together. We have announcements from the pilots. We have announcements at the gates. And everyone is understanding that the entire airline ecosystem has this problem, not just flight attendants, not just gate agents. But we need to do more. All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. And we'll respond. We'll need Blunt and I will want answers on the Brand USA because it's been a huge priority for the tourism industry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our panel for being here today. Inflation is up 6.8% year over year, accelerating at its fastest pace in almost 40 years. Americans across the country are feeling the pain of increased costs of goods with higher prices from a carton of milk to a gallon of gasoline. As airline executives, what inflationary factors are most concerning to your companies as we move into 2022, and will these factors impact airfare? Why don't we start with you, Mr. Parker? Thank you. Uh, the, the largest one for us is, is fuel. Um, it's our second largest expense at American. Um, our wages actually aren't done, aren't, don't have enormous inflationary pressure because we have 85% union jobs and our people are very well paid. Um, but um, we, we certainly are seeing fuel cost increases. It's a commodity that's volatile. Um, but certainly in the last couple of months, that increase is gonna have a, is gonna have a significant impact uh, on our cost structure. And yeah, at some point that will, that will result in higher fares. Okay. Mr. Kelly. I would echo Doug's comments um, and just say that <clears throat> as we're recovering and trying to get our schedule back to maximum efficiency uh, as we were uh, uh, close to a pre-pandemic, if you will, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to drive down. Uh, we're fixed cost uh, industry, so there's a lot of opportunities to drive down our unit cost. Uh, but until that time, we'll have some inflationary cost pressures. Uh, uh, you know, maybe just a little bit different uh, comment is, you know, we are seeing wage pressure across the board with frontline employees, and we're competing with other sectors, uh, especially for airport workers. So inflation is real. It is a concern. Uh, at the same time, if you look at airfares, the inflation-adjusted airfares have been trending down for decades and certainly have been trending down since 2014. So uh, we're doing our best to hold the line uh, in terms of uh, airfare inflation. And we, we appreciate that they were trending down, but um, I believe now they're going to be trending up. And how long do you think uh, that will last? Well, obviously we compete. So uh, well, I'm not speaking for the industry, but we're low cost, we're low fare, we don't charge bag fees, we don't charge change fees, so we're gonna do our best to be Americans leading low fare carrier going forward. Okay. 
Mr. Kirby. Uh, I would echo what uh, both these gentlemen have said. Um, fuels are highest, are most volatile, um, and, and most susceptible to, to inflation. Another one that I would add is airports. Um, you know, a lot of airports had lower revenues because there were fewer <coughs> flights around the country, and so some of the airport and fees for air navigation are going up. Those are probably the highest in a percentage increase. Um, and we'd hope we're, we're working to, and hopefully will, uh, get ways to moderate those because it's the last thing, obviously, we and our people need. Uh, and then the third one is what, is what Gary said, which is, you know, all of the support services around aviation um, are feeling pressure, uh, whether, you know, it's everything, whether it's people to fuel airplanes or security, airport workers and restaurants. Um, and all of that is, is tends to flow through uh, to us whether they have the contractual right or not, people, our vendors will say, we either are going to go out of business or you're going to have to pay us more because we simply can't hire people. Um, so it's mostly about hiring people in those kinds of jobs. Okay. Mr. Lauder. Um, I, I would first say thank you again to Congress and the U.S. taxpayer for getting us in the position that we are today. And I would just want to emphasize the point of uh, returning to our full scale as being the best thing that we can do to combat these inflationary pressures. Um, I think that, as my, I mentioned earlier, uh, getting international open, keeping it open, and continuing to restore our full network is going to be the number one thing that we can do. When you look at the, when you look at the energy costs that you're facing here, fuel costs, and when you're um, looking at at um, pressure and trying to have enough employees as you're as you're building up your your flights again, uh, how how is that going to um, affect you uh, your your economic uh, outlook for 2022? Well, so for Delta, um, we we continue to hire. We've hired about uh, over 8,000 people this year, and that's a key part of getting back to that return that we're talking about. We uh, at at my company see um, our recovery continuing through 2022 and into 2023, um, and that I think the the question there will be when do the international markets fully reopen. Um, but, but we see continued up, um, you know, we do, we have a new variant out there that we're um, keeping an eye on. And I think that long term, though, um, we just, we continue to um, uh, regain that scale through the course of 2022. And Mr. Lauder, it uh, was recently announced that Delta is going to be ending a daily service between our capital city of Lincoln and Minneapolis on January 10th. Uh, I would like to be able to have a conversation with you about that or uh, so, some written questions for the record, please. Absolutely. I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that uh, uh, Senator Hickenlooper is going to be next. Senator Baldwin is deferred to you very graciously. I, I am always in, in, in deeper debt to Senator Baldwin. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Thank you all for making time. I know how busy you all are. I know what challenging years you've each had. Uh, Mr. Kirby, I thought I'd start with you uh, just because you've had such a busy year. Uh, partnership with Boom Supersonic based in Colorado, which is uh, pr procure super, will allow United to pr procure supersonic aircraft using sustain sustainable aviation flu, fuel. Uh, and then you were on that first flight uh, from Chicago to D.C. with 100% sustainable aviation flu in one engine, which somehow seems out of balance to me to this day. Um, and then also your investment in the middle of just a, a, a week ago or less than a week ago in hydrogen electric engines for regional <coughs> aircraft flights. For, a, I commend you for the, the, the initiative that you're showing. Uh, but uh, recognizing the, the, the damage done by COVID and the pandemic, um, how will airlines like United be able to continue to pursue climate ambitions amidst, you know, the economic recovery? Is that something that is, should be of great concern? Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Senator, for the, for the kind words. We are exciting. We're excited to be part of that innovation on the other side of the COVID and looking to the future. Um, and, and my answer to, you know, how can we do it is we don't have a choice. We have to do it first and foremost because it's the right thing to do for the planet. But at some point also, uh, either our customers, 
our shareholders, our regulators, um, the legislative branch are going to force us to do it because it is the right thing to do. Um, and this industry, because it's hard to decarbonize, uh, needs to start making the seed investments to build that foundation. It's the reason that I think the, build, uh, the, the blender's credit is so important. Uh, to me, doing for aviation, what we, want, what we need to do is run the same playbook that we ran as a country, as a globe, for wind and solar 20 years ago. 20, wind and solar were uneconomic 20 years ago, but here there were credits, there was support, there was certainty for the industry, it drove massive investment that came down the cost curve, built economies of scale, and it's now cheaper to produce power with wind and solar than it is with, with fossil fuels. We need to run that same playbook. We know the playbook that works and, and what's, um, you know, the, the current blender's tax credit, you know, really will drive the kind of investment that we need. Because we need, we estimate $250 billion of investment to get the global in aviation industry to 10% SAF. This will be what kickstarts and drives the start of that private investment uh, to make that happen. Um, and I know from previous conversations with Mr. Parker and Mr. Kelly that they share your sentiments on, in this regard. Um, uh, Mr. Lofter, I, I will start earlier with the discussion of discontinued flights. Uh, Grand Junction is about 300 miles west of, of Denver, or 280 miles west of Denver, um, and you've been flying there for decades uh, from Salt Lake City to, to uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, they remain 90% full. Uh, it's a critical route for, for Grand Junction. It fits into their economic package in a variety of ways. Just what I've always been told airlines want to become an essential part of a, of, of a local economy. Um, it really is a key travel hub to uh, access to a number of Western cities that, uh, you know, the, it's been used 24 years over millions of customers. Um, and just in the last uh, this year alone, we've had 80,000 customers flying on that route, uh, and yet they heard they were recently uh, announced, very recently announced, that uh, that flight's going to be discontinued. Um, what, uh, what economic conditions are you considering in terms of making these decisions, and what should uh, state officials, how can we create uh, an environment where this doesn't happen? Well, Senator, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. The, the one area that we are seeing um, a labor shortage, and I think it's short-lived, is in our regional pilots. And so as the major airlines are, are hiring pilots, and because of the fact that in 2020 there was a gap where there was uh, much lower flying, which sort of disrupts the, the training pipeline and the uh, captain upgrade in, in the regional world, um, that's sort of impacting us at this point. And so as we look out, um, we aren't able to serve every place that we would like to. And so I, I do think that that's short-lived and we see recovery happening in 2022. And so uh, as always, the, these um, cities, we, we desire to serve them. And so I think that it's part of our continual analysis to see when we can get back in there. And we have resumed service to some places that were suspended during the pandemic. Great, well, I'll tell the people at Grand Junction to that doesn't usually work very well uh, with our local officials, but I'll give it my best, uh, my best shot. Uh, I'll yield back time to the chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Senator Thune. Madam Chair, thank you, and thanks to all of you for agreeing to testify today as the country continues to grapple with supply chain challenges. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the recovery that uh, U.S. airlines have had from the major disruptions of travel last year when the pandemic emerged, and I think a lot of it was due to the success of the payroll support program, which has kept airlines running and their employees working, uh, even when travel numbers plummeted. As Thanksgiving travel numbers indicate, the industry is starting to see a, a, a pretty strong recovery in domestic air travel, and I'm hoping that we'll see that similar recovery in the international air travel next year as vaccination campaigns continue and the world uh, becomes more accustomed to handling these new coronavirus variants. Um, as the strong recovery uh, progresses, I want to continue to emphasize the importance of considering rural communities, which have felt a disproportionate impact from pandemic-related service reductions as longer-term service decisions are made. Um, Mr. Kirby, could you uh, describe how United is working with code share partners to maximize service in smaller markets, and then I'll ask this of Mr. Parker uh, when he concludes his uh, answer, if you could provide some examples of innovative approaches your airline's taken to form partnerships with other carriers uh, or communities to ensure stability and service. 
Uh, well, thank you, Senator Thune. And it follows on, um, you know, to the to the previous past question. Um, there has been a looming pilot shortage for the last decade in the United States, and going through COVID, it became an actual pilot shortage. Uh, so all of us, particularly our regional partners, um, simply don't have enough airplanes to fly. We have almost 100 airplanes effectively grounded right now, um, regional aircraft, because there's not enough air, there's not enough pilots to fly, them, which means uh, we just can't, at the moment, fly to all the small communities that we would like to. Um, it's, it's really about not having enough pilots. Um, I'm a little less optimistic that that situation is going to reverse itself um, in the near term unless we do something to increase the supply of pilots. At United, uh, we've bought and uh, have our first uh, an academy called Aviate Academy. We had our first class start on Monday of this week with 30 uh, people, 79% of them diverse, um, also another opportunity. Um, these are 30 people that have no flight experience that are going to get the opportunity uh, to become pilots. And if they pass all the certification and all the tests, um, can become commercial airline pilots at the end of the program. Um, we're going to need a lot more programs like that. The country's going to need thousands of pilots. And is that a function primarily of just more aggressive recruiting? Uh, no, it, it's really a function of creative. The, the problem to become a pilot, particularly at the 1500 hour rule, yeah. is you need to spend $150,000. And that's typically not eligible for government loans like other you know, if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, you can get loans and go to school. If you want to be a commercial airline pilot, you can't do that, even though your career earnings are higher and we need those people. Um, so creating ways that they can finance and fund their ability to get the requisite training is really the foundation. And I think it's the only way we're going to solve this problem for small communities, because I expect it's going to get worse before it gets better. We have to have a higher supply of pilots, and we just don't have enough today. All right. Well, I, I, I know we'd all be interested in things that uh, we could do to help and in, provide incentives to fill that pipeline or refill Thank that you. pipeline. Uh, Mr. Kelly, or Mr. Parker, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah so, um, well, look, service to small communities is incredibly important to American Airlines. Uh, we serve some 230 uh, cities in the United States. Obviously, a number of those are, are smaller communities uh, and um, places like you know, Sioux City and Rapid and um, Sioux Falls and Rapid City are important to that. Um, so. And we, and we would like to serve more, frankly, over time. Um, but I, again, at this point in time, I agree with, you know, with, with where Scott is. We, we at American have not yet, well, we've, we serve the same number of cities we did uh, prior to the pandemic. We've, we've terminated, we've lost some service to three cities, but we've added three others. Um, so, but it is an issue, uh, it is gonna be an issue for our ability to serve uh, if we can't uh, recruit enough pilots into the regional airlines. Um, but, Again, I think I believe we can get that solved, but that is certainly an issue that we're concerned about going forward. It hasn't affected American yet. As to ways to make it even better, as you asked, um, alliances that we've established at American with, with airlines like Alaska and JetBlue uh, make it more likely for us to be able, be able to serve uh, smaller markets because we can just connect people to more places. Um, so this is all, all of our business is about connecting people and connecting dots, and the and the more ways we can do that um, through either alliances uh, or our on our own metal. We, we're looking to do all the time. Good. Uh, and very quickly, and this has been alluded to already, if you could touch on uh, utilizing sustainable aviation fuel to further um, reduce your emissions. Uh, I'm concerned about ICAO's carbon emissions modeling for SAF, which penalizes American farmers because of its treatment of induced land use changes versus the DOE's more favorable and I would argue accurate GREEP model. What are your airlines doing to increase the use of, uh, and I know it's been talked a little bit, of, uh, uh, touched on already, but of SAF, and can you commit to utilizing homegrown biofuels? Yes, sir. Again, we're, we, that's the answer to getting us to carbon neutral is sustainable aviation fuels, um, and uh, you know, we, 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 we're all dedicated to doing just that. Okay. Tim? Yeah, I, I would agree, and in, in fact, you know, the, the targets that have been established are very ambitious, and it's going to take a, a, a sea change from where we are uh, to achieve that, and we need to cast a very broad net in terms of, uh, of raw materials to produce it, so we would be very supportive of that. Yeah, screw me. Well, Senator, I think it's important that we get on a level playing field with road fuels, uh, which we're not today. Uh, there are a lot of incentives that exist for that, not for, for fuels. But I also think as a globe, we're at some point going to have to come to grips with our sustainable fuels need to come from sources other than just farm food. So, you know, municipal solid waste, woody yeah. biomass, whatever it is, you maybe even power to liquids. Advanced. Uh, we're going to have to come to grips with that too. Yeah. Okay, good.
And Senator, I would just echo these comments that, that we have ambitions and goals to increase our, our use of sustainable aviation fuels. We need it produced on the scale that so, will support this industry, and we look forward to partnering with you and Congress on that. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator uh, Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to start off where uh, uh, Senator Thune started off with regard to uh, uh, the need for additional pilots. Um, in my home state of Wisconsin, we have a lot of small communities that are served by uh, uh, regional aircraft. And uh, Mr. Kirby, uh, a United Express Air Carrier, Air Wisconsin, is based mm -hmm. in uh, our state. Um, they fly the 50-seat aircraft. And uh, statements uh, that you made uh, last month at the Skift Aviation Forum about markets that rely on these 50-seaters um, greatly concern me, as you can imagine. Now, I'm working on legislation that would make flight education and training programs more accessible um, to a broader range of students, precisely by increasing uh, the amount of student loan aid available for individuals who are enrolled in an accredited program, um, all to ensure that we're going to have a strong pipeline of pilots to fly small, uh, to small communities and everywhere that travelers want to go. So um, it, it, I know there's a counterpart that's been introduced in the House of Representatives. We're just trying to put the final touches on it uh, right now for Senate introduction. But would you agree that such a proposal would encourage more people to become pilots? And what uh, more is United doing to recruit and retain pilots? Yeah, as well, thank you, Senator. And, and for what it's worth, some of those markets are going to get upgaged to bigger airplanes. Uh, but air, but small cities that are entirely reliant on 50-seat service um, are, are at risk unless we create a high, bigger supply of pilots. So I, I apologize. I'm not familiar with the specifics of your bill. But the idea of increasing the supply of pilots is really important. And the government has a huge role to play uh, in helping us do that. At United, we've tried our self-help measure of using our Aviate Academy um, as a way. And, and we intend to train 500 new pilots a year. It's not just about creating the next generation of pilots. It's a safer program. It's much more like U UPT going to pilot training at the Air Force or you know the Navy, where you learn not just to fly. You fly aerobatics. You fly in complicated airspace. Um, it improves diversity. So there's a lot of great things we can do. But there's a real opportunity for this. And these are great careers. I mean, a, a captain at United Airlines, and we have two, over 200 wide-body airplanes. The captains on those airplanes uh, make $400,000 a year with great benefits. I mean, there's not many careers left like that in the United States. So we, we just need to help people get in, onto the first rung of the ladder, get through the rigorous training process so they have enough certification to start at an airline and then they can make their careers. But we are all on board with doing anything we can to increase that supply and to help do that. Great. Um, I want to uh, switch focuses now to one area where I think the industry has a great opportunity to emerge from the pandemic much better than before, and that is um, the topic of travel for individuals with disabilities. Um, I recognize that air travel has been anything but normal uh, since the early days of COVID-19. Um, but in looking at uh, disability-related complaints filed with the Department of Transportation, um, there seems to have been a significant increase in complaints filed in 2021 as compared uh, to 2018. And so a question for each of you to answer, uh, uh, what, uh, what, are you, what is your airline doing to address uh, disability-related complaints? And why don't we start with you, Mr. Parker? Thank you. Look, it, it is, it is, a, it is an, it's certainly an issue that we were working very hard to address. Um, it's a difficult situation on aircraft, of course, and it has been. We, we are all working very hard to do uh, everything we possibly can. It, interested in working and continuing to work with you on, on other things that might be done. We at American, for example, uh, while we know we're not doing as well as we can, we're, we are encouraged by the fact that uh, the number of, uh, due to a lot of effort, the number of wheelchair damages that we've had are down 40%. Um, over the last year, so uh, again, not by no means uh, are where we where we need to be, um, but we are intensely focused on on being on being the best we can in this regard. Mr. Kelly, I, I think uh, you know here in the in the short term, our our primary focus is on uh, wheelchairs training, um, trying in reducing the damage, and uh, also working with 
wheelchair manufacturers to see what can be done to harden uh, wheelchairs. They're, they're just not built to be loaded into air, aircraft bins uh, and transported. So I think there's opportunities there. And uh, like, like Doug reported, we're definitely seeing our, uh, our, our claims uh, coming down, which is uh, obviously very welcome. Uh, more futuristic, we're working with the manufacturers or, or intend to work with the manufacturers in terms of uh, bathroom access on board the airplane, which is uh, obviously a big challenge, and especially on narrow body airplanes. Uh, but those are the two primary things that we're working on. Mr. Kirby. Uh, we, we also have been very, it's a high priority for us uh, and focused on wheelchairs um, and have had a significant reduction in wheelchair damages, wheel, wheelchair complaints. Um, like Gary said, it's tough um, because, you know, the wheelchairs just aren't built. In spite of that, we're focused very hard uh, on that. We're doing a lot of other things uh, for people with disabilities. We're the first airline, for example, to get our website and our app for blind, if you're blind, um, for the visually impaired to be able to use it. And there's a lot of things like that. We have a whole team, and I coincidentally uh, met with that team uh, this past week um, on all the things we can do uh, to, to improve the world for, for disabled and a passionate group because most of them it's personal. They're either disabled themselves or have family members that are disabled. Um, and having a team like that to advocate for it, you know, is probably one of the best things that we can do internally uh, to make sure we drive the kinds of changes, identify what the issues are and then drive change. Mr. Lauder. Um, Senator, I, I would add that um, wheelchairs and assistive devices are a focus for Delta and we, we certainly uh, are, are working towards zero, that's our goal. We've also created an advisory board on disability, which is made up of Delta customers who volunteer their time from the disability community in, and to help us throughout the travel ribbon make travel more accessible. Great, thank you thank for you. your indulgence. I will submit one uh, additional question for the record. Um, uh, just relating to the fact that uh, in um, airports, uh, people with disabilities um, often rely on folks that you've contracted with to um, help with uh, mobility in the airports. And um, I have some specific questions about that. Thank you. Great. Senator Moran. Chairwoman, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to our panelists for being here. Let me start where uh, Senator Thune led, uh, which is with um, rural communities. Uh, both American and United are significant suppliers of air service across our state. Essential air service is a significant component of the ability to do that. I, I think it was uh, you, Mr. Kirby, that talked about the cost of uh, training and educating a pilot. To, and uh, I assume that, the, that are the revenues insufficient to cover the costs of, of pilots in those smaller towns? Is it harder to cover? And then my question becomes, is essential air service a method by which we could better compensate the airlines for service that is uh, less financially rewarding, if that's the case? Yeah, Senator, thanks for the question again. Um, and it, it is really important. To, like, our bread and butter is flying to those small cities and connecting the world. We really want to, we don't want to take any of the cities off the map. And the issue, though, is, is not really about economics. Um, if it is, it's about economics for individuals who are deciding on their careers when they get out of college or when they're wherever and deciding, do I go to law school or do I go to an air, you know, a commercial airline pilot. Um, and historically, we've never been involved in training pilots because a lot of them came out of the military or through other sources. Um, and now the demand that we have for pilots simply exceeds the supply. Um, so we're starting our Aviate Academy. We've begun to start training pilots. But I don't know that we're going to be, you know, it's not what we've historically done. Uh, our goal is to train 500 pilots a year. That's, you know, we're going to be hiring two to 3,000 a year. Um, so it's even a small percentage of what we're hiring uh, at United. And, and so I think we probably need something broader. You know, I, you know, as much as we like getting EAS money when we fly to markets, I'd much rather take those funds and put them into the infrastructure to create training for pilots and to build a robust pipeline that makes it easy for people with an aptitude and a desire to be a commercial airline pilot, to get the training, to get the skills that they need. You know, I would like to focus on giving them better training than they've gotten in the past so that they come out more like a military training trained pilot than, than somebody who's, you know, hasn't been through that path. And I think there's an opportunity to make our system safer, better, create great jobs, and, and fix the pro supply problem. But the supply problem isn't going to get fixed in the short term because it takes time to get through the process to become a commercial airline pilot. So, uh, resources to support uh, pilot education and training. Correct. Is the request. Yeah. 
Mr. Parker, anything? No, I agree. It's, it's uh, making more markets EAS markets would take a scarce resource and move it to different markets. Um, but it, the, the real point here is that there's just not enough resource. Uh, my question was, Was there are there essential air service resources that could be devoted to uh, creating the revenue oh, necessary to educate it, pilots, right. well, yeah. not creating more essential air service opportunities? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Per yes, I would agree that diverting them to, to pilot training would be a great idea. Um, I got to run that by my communities, but <laughs> it, uh, it is a huge component to Kansas. We, other than Alaska, probably are the most uh, essential air service uh, state in the country, and we appreciate the service you provide. Um, let me ask, look, first of all, let me indicate to Ms. Nelson that uh, I am a frequent flyer, and I have lots of contact with gate agents and with uh, flight attendants. Uh, my experience uh, pre and post COVID has been uh, almost without exception, nothing but uh, tremendous uh, care, compassion, professionalism by those who serve in those capacities. And I want to thank you and those you represent for the manner in which they've conducted themselves, certainly to me, but more importantly, to the flying public in very difficult and challenging times. Thank you so much. Appreciate that so much, Ms. Uh, Senator Moran. And um, we love that you fly with us. And um, also, I would just note, I, I want to add to what was said here. Uh, the more that we can uh, show the public that these jobs are for everyone in it, that they're for women, that they're for people of color, and then that we can give them the means to be able to get that training to get to it. We can actually increase the number of people who are willing to do this work. So I just wanted to add that as well. And thank you so much for your comments. We'll share that with our members. Very, I'm very complimentary. And um, I would again offer, as others have had, uh, have done so, uh, any way that we can assist. I don't know anything about to-go alcohol. <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. Uh, but uh, not that it's going to change my behavior, but uh, <laughs> now that I glad, know if that's a Glad problem, you clarified I'm, that. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm uh, happy to try to help uh, assist to reduce the friction that uh, can occur as a result of that. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Lauder, the opportunity I had to visit Delta Airlines in Atlanta uh, a few weeks ago. And um, I raised a, a couple of topics, although I mostly came there to listen and learn, but I checked with my uh, airports, I would highlight for you the, uh, the opportunity that Wichita, ICT, considers to, uh, to fly to uh, Salt Lake City and uh, would welcome that. It seemed like there was interest, but uh, I would welcome any further conversation. I also want to thank you for uh, the passenger lounge, the premium passenger lounge that you intend to build uh, within the new airport in Kansas City. Uh, and why are you laughing? It's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that you've chosen to, to assist in our new airport and its uh, comforts and amenabilities. Um, and um, in addition to that, uh, Southwest, I saw in the, in the business journal, uh, Kansas City Business Journal is uh, uh, going to pursue its sustainability efforts uh, in Kansas City. And again, uh, we welcome that uh, further connection between uh, Kansas City and uh, Southwest. One of the bills that uh, the chairman of this committee was very helpful in uh, seeing was passed as a bill that I introduced to provide assistance. The Aviation Manufacturing Jobs Protection Program designed to provide assistance to the workforce within those industries, those businesses that manufacture airplanes and its components. And I again thank the chairwoman for her help in that accomplishment. But uh, I would, I would, I want to make certain that it's known that uh, the ability to build uh, new airplanes is not just a manufacturing issue, it's an airline issue. And I would like to, if you wouldn't mind confirming that, assuming that that's true, what it means to you to be able to uh, continue to access new aircraft, often built uh, in Kansas. Right. And if you could quickly, oh, because no. he's over time, and I want to get to, we, you can see that the, the subject of this hearing and your uh, being here, which I think actually is the first time that we've had uh, many of you here in almost a decade, that you can see that this committee has a lot of aviation issues, and I want to make sure all our colleagues get questions. I'm but sorry, Chairwoman. I didn't no, realize I was over time. I, I know, but, but I, that's because I know how much you care about this issue. So You, you were saying well, nice things just, about the chair, too. Right, so exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll try, and do it, I'll, try and do it, I'll try and do it real fast for yeah, all of us. I'm you. sure we're all going to say the same thing. It's critical to us, of course. We have to have airplanes. We appreciate your work in getting in getting support into those into those uh, um, companies. Uh, they needed it like we did, um, and they're, they're crucial to what we do, so thank you. Ditto, and I would just add that it's uh, also a very significant part of our sustainability plan, which is to continue to modernize our fleet right. 
the MAX is 14% more fuel efficient than the previous generation, so very important. For the record, I'd ask your plans in regard to the MAX, uh, but I'll take that for in, in testimony. Thank you, Senator Moran, and thanks for working on that uh, manufacturing bill with me, and I appreciate your leadership on it, and uh, I do think it got money out to uh, people in Kansas, particularly uh, one of the big suppliers. So it's, anyway, Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, according to uh, CBS News, the airline industry still owes flyers upwards of $20 billion in refunds, which is simply unjust and immoral. That's why Senator Blumenthal and I sent a letter to the Airline Industries Trade Association yesterday demanding once again that every airline provide immediate refunds for canceled flights during the pandemic. We've now made this appeal over and over again, yet the airlines refuse to do the right thing. Uh, will each of you commit to providing refunds for all tickets that were canceled due to the pandemic, regardless of whether you canceled the flight or a passenger canceled in order to protect the health of a family member? Will you commit to the refunding uh, this money? Yes or no? Mr. Parker. Uh, Senator, we've, we refunded uh, $3.2 billion of, of uh, cash refunds in 2020 alone. Uh, we did that for every flight that we canceled uh, for flights. No, I'm talking about the flights that passengers canceled because of their justifiable concern about the pandemic and the impact it was having on their yeah, health. Yes, sir. Will you, refund that fund, will you refund that money to passengers. Yeah, what you're asking about is a case where someone has bought a, a non-refundable ticket, condition one, condition two, the, the flight actually flew. So in, in, in which case, we, in that case, um, we did uh, make the uh, extraordinary, for, but, but as, as no, conditions I'm, I'm, weren't- Will you, will you refund to passengers the, uh, the money that they spent on a ticket that they canceled because they were afraid of the COVID risk to right, themselves. Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking Will about. you refund that money? Yes in, or no? In the case of a customer who bought a non-refundable ticket and the flight went and still didn't want to go, what we did is say, well, we're, we're not going to force you, we're not going to make you have it be non-refundable and keep your cash. We will give you a credit to use in the future to fly when you are comfortable flying. And that's where we are on those. And, and, and will you, have you removed an expiration date on that ticket so that we, they can take it whenever they want in the future? In our case, we're up to, we're at March 31st of 2022 right now on the expiration. We move that as the pandemic. Will you system. commit to making it unlimited in terms of the expiration date? Will you commit to doing that? We want to make it, we want to make, we want people to fly. I want to encourage people to fly. Uh, we have moved the date as, as the pandemic. Yeah, again, when, I'm not, I'm still not getting the answers well, that's uh, my from answer. the industry. I, I, the passengers want the money back, and you're not saying you're going to give it to them. And at a minimum, they just want a voucher that they can use whenever they want to. Uh, they shouldn't have to worry that in order to get the cash that they have uh, being used, that they have to jump on a flight in the next three months when the pandemic is now rising. Right. Uh, and they shouldn't even have to worry about that. You should be giving them the voucher now so that they know they can use it for as whenever they want, in whatever month or year that they want, whenever they feel safe with their family member, and you're still telling us today, you will not give those families that kind of a guarantee. And that's unfortunately industry-wide in terms of what the practice is. And I'm just telling you, for, for passengers in our country, uh, they want fairness. They want uh, to know that they are going to be treated in a way which is respectful. And, and I'll also add this, okay? The same thing is true with the, the fees, 30 bucks for one bag, 40 bucks for a second, 150 bucks for a third. Uh, does it really cost $150 to put a bag on a plane? That's a rhetorical question because obviously the answer is no. So time is brief and I just want Ms. Nelson just to make this point. I'm shocked that some of the CEOs here today have suggested that we no longer need mass mandates on planes. Ms. Nelson, in the face of Omicron, children under five who still cannot be vaccinated, thousands of flight attendants who protect us every day, uh, and that we still allow unvaccinated people on planes to fly in our country, do you believe that we should be lifting the mass mandate for people who are on planes in our country? 
I, be I believe that the government has taken a very responsible um, approach to this and is moving the mask mandate as we have more information about the pandemic. And uh, we agree that it should continue to stay in place. It's a workplace safety issue. Although I will be very clear that we do look forward to the day that we can vaccinate the entire world and, and get on with this and not have to have the mask mandate. We, um, we do need a consistent message though, and it troubles me too, to hear different messages. And I would hope that we would all stay on the same message, that we're gonna follow the medical experts and we're going to do what's necessary to keep everyone safe. Yeah, well, right now, there are tens of thousands of people flying who are unvaccinated today on planes in the United States. And it's unfair to people who are vaccinated to have them sitting next to uh, them with their masks off. It would be wrong. It would be immoral to ever take that position. Uh, people are petrified. The airlines won't even reimburse people who, uh, who uh, have canceled the flight because they're afraid to fly, uh, because they uh, could be endangering themselves or their family members with coronavirus. Uh, and from my perspective, it is absolutely unacceptable that that's- Senator true. Markey, I would also just add that we've heard from around the world that the confidence in air travel because of what has been communicated, the controlled um, circumstances, including everyone having to wear masks, is why people have confidence in buying air, tra air tickets today. And we should continue to build that confidence. And I just want to, uh, just to finish up with you, Ms. Nelson, I just want to make it clear my support uh, of the need to do more to put an end to passengers who threaten and assault flight attendants uh, in our country. It is absolutely an epidemic, uh, and we have to take the strongest possible action at the federal level in order to put it to an end. Thank you for your leadership on that issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Markey. Uh, Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here today. As you can see, there's a wide range of issues that people are concerned about. Um, Mr. Kirby, I want to come to you first. In November, Bloomberg published a piece on how United Airlines is leading the charge on implementing President Biden's unconstitutional vaccine mandate. U.S. District Judge Mark Pittman stated that you expressed, and I'm quoting, skepticism and apparent disdain for any religiously motivated exemption request. So what we're finding out, and I've got a Tennessean that is in this group, I represent the state of Tennessee, um, that there are individuals that were denied, that all of your religious exemptions were denied. So we're also finding out about their pay having been cut at the time that that exemption was, was filed. So before they filed the exemption, did you inform these workers that they were not going to be paid even if they applied for a religious exemption? Well, uh, thank you, Senator. And, uh, and first, we did implement a vaccine requirement at United Airlines. We did it in August before there were any federal state, before there were any requirements from any one, one, one direction or the other. Um, we did it purely as a, uh, the right thing to do for safety, and I'm happy to explain why if you'd like. Um, but we did it purely for safety um, and, and did it well before any federal requirements. Uh, we, uh, I think you got some perhaps incorrect information, we accepted about 80% of the religious requests. Uh, so 80% okay. of the religious requests were, were accepted. Okay, but the other 20% that you did not accept, did were they made aware that they would not be paid, even though they were working while their uh, request was being considered, that they would not be paid when that was denied? So we notified people, uh, anyone whose request, was, the 20% who, who did not get a religious exemption, um, we gave them notification and gave them approximately 35 days from that date to get vaccinated if they wanted to. And they were fully paid for that entire time. And the, I, to my knowledge, almost all of them chose to get vaccinated okay. instead of leave the company. So how many people are, how many employees were fired and um, because of this, and then how much money 
did they lose? Do you want to clarify that for the record? So we got 99.7% of our employees vaccinated, which uh, for a workforce in the United States of just under 70,000 uh, means that about 200 people chose uh, to leave the company. About 200. Right. Okay. All right. Um, well, it seems like you're all talking about needing employees, so it seems like you also would f be able to find a workaround on this for people who either have had COVID, don't want the vaccine, cannot take the vaccine. I've talked to so many people who medically have been advised do not get vaccinated because they have a complex medical issue. So it um, seems like you all could find a workaround on this. I want to talk to each of you about um, what is happening with 5G implementation because we had six former chairs of the FCC that sent a letter to Chairman Rosenworcel and the NTIA's acting administrator regarding their concerns with the FAA's decision to delay 5G implementation. And at the end of the letter, the chairs, and I'm quoting, encourage all stakeholders to work together toward a speedy resolution of the issues in this ban. And to ensure these uh, surprises do not become a recurring feature of American spectrum management in the future, the recent decision undermines America's efforts to remain a leader in 5G. And of course, we're looking at what is happening with China, with their Belt and Road Initiative, with great power competition. And um, so we are quite concerned about this. Mr. Lauder, I want to come to you on this because it is my understanding that Delta has invested heavily in 5G for security. So we would hope that you all ha are looking for a path forward to work not only with us but with regulators on the deployment of 5G and making certain that it is not, not delayed. Well, Senator, thank you. And I, I can't speak specifically to any investment in 5G. I, w I do know that the safety concerns uh, with aircraft and aviation are very real. And I also know that there's a solution here. We've seen it in other countries as they've implemented 5G. And with a combination of power adjustments and location, we could absolutely uh, solve this and live in a world where there is 5G yes. available. There are 39 countries that have implemented 5G and have had no issues that we're aware of. Have any of you, any of you on the panel, experienced any issues or problems with 5G? No, uh, but I, I, th I think if you were to ask us what our number one concern is here in the near term, it is the deployment of 5G because the FAA has issued an airworthiness directive that would significantly impact our operations once it is deployed on January the 5th. So that's the essence of the concern. It's not an airline concern per se. The FAA is uncomfortable with the safety risk, and as a consequence, the impact on our operations to mitigate that would be a significant setback. Uh, Seems like we could find a workaround on this. I'm over time, but thank I appreciate that, and we will continue the conversation on the issue. Thank you, Madam yes, Chair. Thank you for bringing that issue up. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. I think, uh, like all my colleagues here, I'm very happy to be flying again. Yeah. And uh, within the past month or so, I have flown, I think, all of your airlines. Uh, and I don't need to tell you that there are a lot of Americans who are still unhappy. Uh, and the reason they're not happy are, is the continued fees and charges for check bags, carry-on bags, all kinds of other things that they used to receive for free and are charged now without any apparent relation to the cost of what they do. So I've led introduction uh, of the Airline Passenger Bill of Rights, and I would be happy to talk about the details. Uh, it essentially speaks to problems relating to overbooked planes, delayed flights, lost luggage, uh, in effect protects consumers against those charges and fees and 
cancellations and delays that they feel violate their essential rights. I would like your commitment that you will support a Bill of Rights. It may not be exactly what I propose. For example, uh, my bill would essentially crack down on airlines using weather as an excuse for delays and cancellations that may be the airline's fault and not a moral fault, but if there's lack of planning, the one who bears the burden ought to be the airline, not the passenger. Uh, it would also provide, require airlines to provide ticket refunds and alternative transportation for flights that are delayed four hours or so. Uh, again, clear enforceable rights. Maybe not exactly those provisions, but I hope that you're all familiar with the basic provisions of the bill. Um, will you support that measure? Let me just ask you, beginning with you, Mr. Parker. We obviously care deeply about our customers. I want to make sure that, that we, like you, want to make sure that our customers are taken care of. Uh, we'd like to not have to have, even have it legislated. We think you do a nice job. But certainly so willing, you, certainly will, willing, you will certainly support, willing, certainly you will willing to work legal, on, legal certainly willing to work with duties. you. Certainly I willing apologize to work. for interrupting, but my time is limited. All right. Certainly willing to work with you, sir. Mr. Kelly? I think what, you know, the industry was deregulated. What we're uh, in favor of is competition and we're pro-consumer. We do not charge bag fees. We don't charge change fees. We don't charge a fee to use your frequent flyer. We don't charge carry-on bag fees. So I assume uh, you would want a level playing field. You'll be supporting that Bill of Rights. We, we, would, we would simply uh, like the opportunity to compete. And that is the way we compete. If our competitors want to charge those fees, they have the right to do that under deregulation, and we would support that going forward. Will you work with me on a Bill of Rights? We're, we're very pro-consumer. Uh, what I think would be very helpful is full disclosure and transparency and that kind of a requirement across the board, not just for airlines, but also for online travel agencies, uh, I think would be very welcome. Good idea. It's part of the Bill of Rights. Mr. Kirby. Uh, thank you, Senator. And uh, we're really proud at United of changes that we've made to improve the customer experience. Thank you for flying again. I'm doing a lot of flying. It's great to be out seeing people again. Um, but we're really proud of everything, that we, you know, permanently eliminating change fees during the pandemic. We copied a good idea that our friends at Southwest had had for a long time. Um, huge investments in the product, huge investments in customer service. Our net promoter scores are at a level we never even thought possible in the next decade. Um, and that's really important. And we're focused on trying to win customers uh, by quality uh, and give them choice. And so I don't think we'll agree with everything you have in the bill. We're certainly happy to work with you. I would tell you one thing that's important is our complaint rates from online travel agencies are about 10 times as high as they are internally. It is because when we, talk, when we interact directly with a customer, we try to tell them, we are trying to be as transparent as possible about what is happening. Um, but that's not true at third parties when they sell tickets on airlines. And anything we can do to get the same level of transparency through third parties as we have ourselves, we'd be very happy to help you with. Thank you. Sir? Uh, Senator, I, I would add that we are also pro-consumer and look, look forward to adding to You're things. You're pro-consumer and pro-competition. <laughs> pro-consumer and pro-competition and look forward to uh, continuing things like uh, eliminating change fees. We've made very public our ambition to make Wi-Fi free for all on Delta, uh, and we're working towards that goal, and we would certainly want to work with you and talk to you further about this. Ms. Nelson, I would ask you this question, but I just want to preface by saying, first of all, really appreciate your strong support for the PSP. I'm very proud to have worked with you on it. I think the flight attendants, in fact, are the unsung heroes of this pandemic. Literally, every time I get on a plane, I thank the flight attendants and I thank the pilots because they have been on duty working at the forefront and uh, I hope that they will be supported by a Bill of Rights as well. Um, they will, and we are very happy that we can talk about these things because of the PSP. You made it possible for us to continue to talk about how we can improve the industry as opposed to going into a long, uh, dire, cost-cutting uh, scenario like we did after 9-11. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just close by saying uh, I'm proud to have supported that 
four billion dollars. I tried to help lead the effort, uh, but I think it creates a trust on your part that you will be forthcoming, and I hope you will work on a Bill of Rights. And I hope also I'll just ask this question for the record. Uh, would you tell me how much, in your estimate, you owe in refunds for canceled flights during this period? Obviously, my colleague, Senator Markey, and I have written to you about this question. Uh, he mentioned $20 billion in total. I'd like to know what amount, if any, you owe for those canceled flights during that period. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to each of the witnesses. Uh, as num a number of senators have observed last year, what Congress did with regard to the aviation industry was critical and it was unprecedented. Uh, we allocated over $54 billion uh, to keep the American aviation industry strong and healthy. Uh, I was the chairman of the aviation subcommittee at the time, each of the CEOs on this panel, and Ms. Nelson, I've spoken to all of you many times. Each of you went on great length making the case that, that maintaining our pilots, maintaining our flight attendants, maintaining our personnel in aviation was critically important. We fast forward to where we are today and we find ourselves in a different circumstance and the behavior of airlines has not been uniform. Um, I'm proud to say the two airlines based in Texas, Mr. Kelly's air, airline and Mr. Parker's airline, I think have been exemplary particularly concerning vaccine mandates. Both of you have made public commitments that you will not be firing your employees because of failure to comply with the vaccine mandate. I thank you for that. Mr. Bastian has likewise made that commitment at Delta. The outlier here is, is United. And Mr. Kirby, United's behavior on this issue, I have to say, has been deeply disturbing. Uh, I'm a frequent customer of United. I live in Houston. I've got over a million miles on United. There are over 14,000 United employees in the state of Texas. And the way United has treated its employees is in marked contrast to your competitors sitting here. Your competitors have said they will stand with their employees. United has not made that same commitment. How many pilots has United fired because of failure to comply with the vaccine mandate? Uh, well, Senator, uh I'm happy to talk also about the rationale for why we did it. We did it for safety. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I have a limited time, safety. so my question is how many pilots have you fired? I believe it is six out of 13. Okay. And how many pilots have you p placed on unpaid leave? Uh, I think it's about 80. Okay. How many flight attendants have you fired? Uh, I don't know the number. In total, it's about 200 employees. Well, I will tell you, I spoke this morning to the airline employees for health freedom that said they had over 2,000 United employees who had been placed on unpaid leave because they sought exemptions from the vaccine mandate. They said that, said that included 331 pilots. I will also note that I have been literally inundated with United employees complaining about United's callous disregard for the rights of the, pi of the pilots. One of the messages was from a pilot who flew for United for more than two decades, who applied for and received an exemption from your vaccine mandate on religious grounds, and it was subsequently placed on leave with no pay and no benefits, including no medical insurance. Now his wife, who relies on her husband's insurance, has had to postpone a necessary surgery with no idea when she'll be able to reschedule because she, she has no idea when her husband will be able to fly again. And you're simultaneously enforcing a non-compete so this pilot can't even go work for your competitors. Another message I received from another pilot, a constituent self-described proud Texan, flew for the Air Force for almost three decades, including missions in Asia, now founds himself on indefinite unpaid leave with a denial of all benefits to include medical, dental, vision, insurance, disability, travel privileges, crew member access to jump seats, denied access to his retirement savings. This morning, I spoke with a 10-year flight attendant for United, a woman named Ms. Adriana Ubali, who is a single mom, an Hispanic single mom from Texas, who you fired. She received her termination notice tied in a trash can to her front gate. I have a letter here, Madam Chairman, from, from uh, Ms. Ubali describing the disgraceful treatment she received at the hands of United. I ask unanimous consent this record to be entered, this letter Without be entered objection. in the record. 
Just recently, you're being sued by your employees for mistreating them, for violating their terms of employment. Just recently, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals Judge James Ho, someone I know very well, an exemplary jurist, wrote an opinion in which he described the likelihood of your employees succeeding on the merits as the claims against you, quote, appear compelling and convincing at this stage. And I want to read what Judge Ho wrote about United. Title VII forbids employers from retaliating against employees who attempt to exercise their statutory rights. Yet United CEO Scott Kirby told employees in a company town hall meeting that, quote, very few religious exemptions to the vaccine mandate would be granted and that anyone who even attempted to request one would be, quote, putting their job on the line. I saw that video, and it's a disturbing video. He went on to note, this is again Judge Ho writing, the district court thus concluded that United's mandate reflects an apathy, if not antipathy, for many of its employees' concerns and a dearth of toleration for those expressing a diversity of thought through both its policy and its official statements to employees. United has demonstrated a, quote, calloused approach to and apparent disdain for people of faith. Why is United's conduct disregarding the rights of your employees so different from the conduct of your competitor air airlines, which are protecting the rights of their pilots and flight attendants and not firing them or putting them on unpaid leave for exercising their religious liberty rights? Well, Senator Cruz, uh, again, we did this for safety. Uh, we believe it saved lives. I think that's my number one obligation is safety, uh, particularly running an airline. And Do you have and an doing obligation to your customers? Uh, my number one obligation is safety, um, including to our customers. Are your competitors unsafe? Uh, I think that the world is safer um, for us. I made the decision for United. I'll let the, my competitors speak for themselves. Uh, I made the decision for United uh, that getting everyone vaccinated would save lives and well, would Mr. create Kirby, a safer environment for all the other workers. Mr. Kirby, I will tell you this. My time but I will tell you this. I fly United flight almost every week. Almost without exception, when I'm on one of your flights, I get stopped by a pilot or a flight attendant, often multiple pilots or multiple flight attendants, who say thank you for fighting for us. Your employees are being mistreated and it's disappointing. Your company is better than this and what you're doing is wrong. Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for all of you for being here today. Um, uh, before I ask my questions, I just hope everybody in this country actually gets a vaccine. I am absolutely tired of this pandemic. I'm tired of what we're dealing with. We have a tool that works. It's safe. It's effective. And if people take a vaccine, we can get through this. No one has a right to spread a disease around and get other people sick. Get a vaccine. Please, let's focus on, on that. But anyway, let me get back to my questions here. Uh, Mr. Lauder, um, clearly it's uh, essential that the, uh, the economy can provide good paying jobs for, for everybody uh, who, who wants one. Uh, the aviation industry offers an awful lot of uh, really great opportunities for folks to earn a good living, support their families, and oftentimes they don't need a, a college uh, degree in order to get these great jobs. And we have to make sure that uh, future generations are able to take advantage of those opportunities that are out there. Yeah, I understand that Delta is uh, pursuing a skills first hiring approach uh, that is based uh, on candidates uh, not having, uh, or, or not based rather on, on folks uh, having a four year degree. Could you tell this committee more about uh, the Delta program and how we can open up even more careers in the aviation industry, perhaps providing skills training and in fact, in the Build Back Better plan, there's significant investments in skills training, understand there are jobs that are available for people, we need to fill those jobs, but some specific skills training is absolutely critical. Clearly, you're leaning into that. If you could uh, tell the committee how we could be of help would be, uh, would be great. Well, Senator, thank you for that opportunity to talk about um, jobs, opening the aperture, and creating more and more opportunity at Delta uh, across many different um, parts of the company. I, you know, the, the place that's easiest to talk about is what we're doing with our own internal pilot program. Uh, it's called Propel. And, and it is specifically driven to allow not only internal candidates to express, internal non-pilot candidates to express, uh, express desire to learn to fly and to be part of our pilot group. Um, and along with that comes 
various guidance and mentoring um, and, and direction into different programs, but it also partners with colleges and universities uh, across the country. And it's, to, its goal is, again, to open the aperture and to make aviation, particularly technical careers, uh, more available to others. We've recently uh, uh, changed as many of our jobs as we could from college degree required uh, to preferred. And, and that in and of itself removes a hurdle for many people. So lots of different opportunities to do that across the system. Well, that's great. And we'd love to work uh, with you as we try to expand that uh, throughout a variety of industries as well to create opportunities uh, for people. Mr. Parker, uh, in, in your uh, written testimony, you noted that uh, airfares have declined to the lowest level since the late 1990s, uh, which is certainly an example of uh, prices dropping and enhancing uh, value for, for your customers. Uh, and as we think back uh, what this, uh, what we had to do in order to keep the av aviation industry going during the pandemic with the uh, payroll support program, uh, clearly I would think without that program uh, would have been devastating to the industry and, and probably would have uh, perhaps uh, uh, led to uh, further consolidations in industry, less competition, and perhaps even rising prices. Could you talk a little bit about how important that program was and did it indeed help uh, keep prices down for consumers? I, absolutely. Thanks for asking. Uh, as, I, as I stated in my written testimony, there was, well, well there, was, there was a lot of support for the airline business uh, right the, at the start of the pandemic. Uh, there was a suggestion that perhaps we should, we should just get it in loans. Um, and as, as we wrote in our testimony, had that happened, um, we would, obviously we would have taken it as companies. But the right thing for us to do when given loans is to make sure we're doing everything we can to be sure to repay those loans. Uh, with no demand, we, I can't speak for everyone, but I'm certain most all of us would have shut down our airlines, uh, furloughed everyone, waited for demand to return. Uh, as it turns out, that was probably going to be after the vaccines came out in early 2021 uh, before we started flying again. It would have been cataclysmic. Uh, to employment, it would have been cataclysmic to our companies. Uh, I don't know how long we could have survived just spending nothing and, and producing no revenues, but it would have been obviously uh, a huge problem for the country as well. Because instead, PSP was used as the program instead of loans, because we were paid to pay our people, because we made commitments to, to continue service to every market, we made commitments to not furlough, to not voluntarily separate anyone, uh, we kept the airlines flying. And, we, and, we, and as, as demand has returned, we are here. So unlike other businesses uh, that where you see inflation, as they're not able to actually meet demand, um, so prices rise, or we are actually, we have more supply than, than there is demand uh, still, and as a result, um, certainly at, for you know, there's, without business customers, et cetera, what you're seeing is prices falling, um, and it's anyway, it's had that effect. Prices are absolutely down. I don't know where they'd be uh, if we if we were flying an airline industry still without PSP, uh, but with certainty because we have it, fares are much lower than they would have been otherwise. Well, that's great to hear, and and uh, our focus has to be to continue to help American families keep uh, costs down, uh, reduce their costs, and just one final. Question related to that, Mr. Mr. Kirby, um, uh, earlier in the hearing, you mentioned that airports' uh, financial health has ramifications for air carriers and the cost of airfare. As, as all of you know, we passed a significant uh, infrastructure package that will make investments uh, in, our, in our airports. Could you comment uh, as to how those investments uh, will also uh, impact, uh, hopefully, uh, the cost to consume, lower cost to yeah. consumers going forward and why we need to make those investments well, to lower cost? Well, thank you, and thank you for the bipartisan effort to pass the infrastructure bill. Um, it's really important to the whole country, not just aviation, to the whole country uh, and our competitiveness around the world. But as you know, many of our airports have not had significant investments. We haven't built new airports. I think Denver is the last big new airport that we built 20-something years ago uh, in this country, and we're not going to start building new airports. But we need to update the infrastructure at those airports. You fly, the, you know, here in Washington, you go out to Dulles, there's a temporary terminal that was temp built to be temporary 30 something years ago. Um, and, and that's not the right thing for our economic competitiveness for, for our status as a nation. So we're excited to have these investments in airports like Dulles or Chicago O'Hare and, and, and lots of others um, as a way to modernize uh, and improve the system. Well, thank you. I appreciate that list of airports. Include Detroit next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's his issue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Young. Hold on, Senator Young. I don't know that we have your audio.
Try again. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see you. me? We can see you and hear you. Oh, fantastic. My apologies. So, uh, gentlemen, I, I will begin with a 5G aviation issue. Indiana was an early adopter of 5G, and new next generation wireless services will result in significant benefits for my state. We need to make sure that any event or claim that will slow the deployment of 5G is based in sound science and facts. We have countries around the globe that are using the same spectrum uh, as the C-band for 5G, and we aren't seeing any issues with aviation. We need to reconcile the aviation concerns contained in a, a single study with what is actually happening on the ground in the real world. So I asked each of our four airline executives um, uh, to kindly ask me, answer me yes or no to this response. If you can't answer yes or no, we'll have to follow up later, but it's my hope you'll, you'll answer yes or no. Mr. Kelly, will you commit to work to resolve the issue that I've just uh, discussed uh, as quickly as possible, yes or no? Yes, and, and again, this is an issue that is raised. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kirby, uh, will you commit to uh, resolve this issue as quickly as possible? Yes or no, sir? Senator, this is the biggest and most damaging potential issue facing us. We want nothing more than to work to a yes. solution. All right, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parker, uh, yes or no? You've heard the question? Uh, yes, um, with per emphasis on the fact that Please, Senator, uh, that it doesn't result in constraining air travel. Um. We'll discuss later. Mr. Uh, Lafter, yes or no? Uh, Senator, yes. I would say, as Mr. Kirby said, the biggest issue facing us right now, we need to work together to resolve this. Right, excellent. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, turning to the payroll support program, as many uh, of us know, in April 2020, passenger traffic for U.S. airlines plummeted over 95 percent compared to the prior year. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's quite the spiral. At that time, we had no idea what the pandemic had in store for us. And over the next year and a half, we took the action we needed to uh, and in short order in a bipartisan fashion to help the U.S. airline industry employees keep their jobs. Uh, payroll Support Program, or PSP, was what we pulled together to solve this unprecedented situation and ensure our airline employees stayed on the payroll and to ensure the airlines that are a central piece of our transportation system were able to stay above water and make it through this devastating uh, situation. Um, we're sitting here in, in December of 2021, coming off a period of, of highly successful Thanksgiving air travel. And I think it's safe to say that PSP was a very effective response to this unprecedented crisis. The program helped the U.S. airline employees uh, get through the toughest months and years in the industry's history. We're seeing those dividends pay off. As Americans choose to return to normal life and travel for business and personal reasons, they're going to find U.S. airlines and airline employees there to help them get from A to B. Uh, can each of you discuss, um, in summary fashion, PSP's impact on your respective airline and how the overall industry would be different today if this program had not been established? Um, sure, Senator Doug Parker. Um, I, first off, thank you for your um, support, your bipartisan, your, your help in, in creating bipartisan support was integral to getting it done. Um, without it, I. I do. I don't know what would have happened to our industry. Uh, it would have been cataclysmic. Um, we 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 wouldn't be flying nearly what we're flying today. I think we wouldn't have been flying hardly any much at very much at all during 2020. Um, and you say you saved a you saved a business, uh, an industry, and I think it made an enormous impact on our ability to keep this economy moving. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator, just add my thanks as well, and. Uh, yeah, the PSP did what um, it was uh, designed to do. It preserved jobs, uh, and those jobs uh, enabled us to uh, continue serving our, uh, co our customers and our communities. Demand is now back, and we're in a position where uh, we can uh, take people where they want to go. So uh, it, it's been a, a huge success, and again, very, very grateful for your support. Thank you. Senator, it was enormously successful, and thank you, and thank you to everyone uh, on a bipartisan basis that supported it. 
uh, the industry wouldn't not only it wouldn't exist uh, anything like it does today had this not happened. And it's not just about the industry; uh, it's about all the millions of jobs that we support um, that are dependent on connectivity and aviation and getting people from from point A to B. And so this was not only about saving the aviation industry; it was about saving an industry uh, that's a critical cog of the U.S. and the global economy. And Senator, I'll add my thanks, too, to Congress and the U.S. taxpayer uh, for, for making sure that we were able to preserve tens of thousands of jobs uh, and make sure that we're in a position to recover uh, in the airline industry and keep things moving as the economy recovers. Thank you, gentlemen. Chairman? Thank you. Senator Sinema. Is Senator Cinema available? Senator Scott. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I'd like to start with Mr. Kirby. Do you, uh, I want to follow up with uh, what Senator Cruz brought up. Do you respect your employees' religious beliefs? Absolutely. Do you think it's, um, do, um, so, so here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the same thing in Florida. Um, you've got a lot of people that work for your company many, many years, and they've been placed on unle unplayed leave after being granted a religious exemption to the vaccine mandate. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits employment discrimination based on religion, yet your company has placed employees who declined to receive the COVID vaccine based on their sincerely held religious beliefs on unpaid leave. So number one, if you respect their religious beliefs, well, how, do you, how, can you just, how can you just put somebody out of work? On top of that, do you believe you're currently in compliance with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act? Uh, so first, Senator, I think it's important to explain our policy actually, which is we've offered everyone an accommodation where they can still work in an, in an area where they're not interacting with customers and people frequently. Uh, so for many of, we've got about 2,000 employees that have either a medical or religious exemption. Um, the majority of those are working in positions um, like agent on demand where they work virtually on the ramp um, where they're outside and don't work with other customers. And we're letting people do that. They have to test and there's a bunch of restrict requirements around testing. Uh, so we're doing that. Uh, the exception to that is in places where they're with other employees and they're with customers, uh, so customer-facing roles. Uh, the biggest area are pilots and flight attendants, and we will let them take one of the other jobs. Uh, but if they want to be pilots or flight attendants, and the flip side of this equation is safety is our number one priority. We absolutely respect their religious rights, but safety is our number one priority. And if you're going to be sitting in a cockpit with someone, and not just in a cockpit, you're going to spend four days with that person traveling to and from the crew bus at night and having breakfast with them and dinner with them. The safety of the employees that they work with also comes to bear and comes to mind. And so that's the reason. And we look forward to the day when the COVID pandemic is enough in the rear view mirror that everyone can return to work, vaccinated or unvaccinated. Uh, but until they can do that safely, and safely for all the employees, um, that's the accommodation that they have. They, ca they can't work in those customer-facing jobs like pilot or flight attendant, and that we absolutely um, are compliant um, with all the legal requirements. So why couldn't, why couldn't you just make them test every day? I mean, you, other companies are doing this. I mean, you're not the only company doing this. It's not just the airline industry. They're, I mean, you, you, can, you can buy, you know, um, tests much, pretty cheaply now. Um, yeah, Senator, it's not about expense. It, it, it really is about safety. And, you know, aviation has a history of being, I would say, two standard deviations better on safety than any other industry. And at United, that is core to our DNA. And we just don't compromise on safety. When we had an issue with our 777s, 52 wide body airplanes, um, with an engine issue, we voluntarily grounded the entire fleet. I mean, that is a massively expensive decision to make. Um, but we did it for safety because it's the right thing to do. Um, and that is our, the, not just our North Star, it's the only star that guides us on our vaccine policies is about safety. And, there's, and testing is good, but 
it's not as good as someone being vaccinated because you have a point in time, if you even if you're testing every day, where you can infect someone else um, before you show up positive. And these are people that were with each other literally for days in a row. And because we don't compromise on safety, those we've done everything we can to find opportunities for them. But those kinds of places where they have to be around other customers for and each other for multiple days, uh, we're not allowing that because of safety. Have you ever lost your job? I have. And how did it feel? I was really angry. <laughs> yeah. the, um, so all of us up here, we're a fiduciary to the taxpayer. We gave your industry $54 billion. And we didn't do it for every industry. Uh, there are a lot of small businesses that didn't get a dime. Um, and you guys did. You got a lot of money. So can each of you just tell us, are we going to get a return? Are the taxpayers of this country, when you think about um, you guys all introduced in, in, uh, entered into an agreement with the U.S. Treasury. Are we going to make money off this investment? Uh, because we're a fiduciary. That's our job. Well, I guess I'll start since I'm on the mic. Uh, I, I think that the country is already getting the return. The return is less a financial return of buying a stock and having it go up. Uh, the return is about what we do for the U.S. economy, what we did for humanitarian relief efforts, carrying hundreds of millions of vaccines, supporting relief er efforts at the beginning of the pandemic, bringing 13,000 refugees home from Afghanistan, repatriating 18,000 Americans that got stranded overseas. Did the get, return is what we do for, for the that? economy. Did you, get in, did you get paid for that, those flights? Uh, some of those we did, but many of them, most of those flew, especially the you know, repatriation flights and things, flew at losses um, because there weren't enough passengers. A lot of those were just commercial airline passengers, and, and we've lost it's hard to add up billions of dollars in the last year and a half doing those kinds of things. But what you did was allowed us to keep flying and keeping those air links uh, alive. We weren't making money on them, um, but the support that we got from Congress, and thank you for it, allowed us to keep those bridges intact, and, and, and we could do it because you were helping fund it. Ms. Parker? Uh, yes, Senator, I would just uh, remind you that the $54 billion was 70 percent in um, 30% in loans, so that 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 is being re that will be repaid. The reason it was 30% in loans because it, it was an analysis done by the Treasury Department at the time that said 70% of what was given to us would be can could be directly saved in um, in a combination of uh, reduction in unemployment, uh, reduction in Medicare, et cetera, reduction in health benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and plus what the U.S. government spends on on would have to spend to actually move people around. Um, so I. I feel I, I would welcome uh, a post audit of this. I think the U.S. government's done extremely well. I'm proud of that. Uh, we owe that to the taxpayers. Uh, but I would I would encourage the committee to ask to ask for a post audit of that. I think you'll be very pleased with the results. Thank you, Senator Senator Rosen. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, uh, Ranking Member Wicker. If you're there, I can't see anyone on the camera today, so. Uh, Thanking you both, but uh, we really thank you for holding this important oversight hearing of the U.S. airline industry. And I appreciate all the witnesses uh, for being here today. Uh, as chair of this committee's subcommittee for tourism, trade, and export promotion, I've worked to find bipartisan pathways and solutions to bring travel and, and the travel and tourism industry back to its pre-pandemic prosperity. I've been especially proud of the collaborative work this committee has done to help workers in those industries. And before I get to my questions, and since we're on the topic of air travel, I want to recognize yesterday's renaming of the Las Vegas airport, which I'm now so proud to be able to call the Harry Reid International Airport. It's one of the busiest airports in the world. It's a gateway to Nevada's tourism economy. Uh, it's a wonderful way to honor mentor and friend, uh, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. But I'd like to really talk about how the airlines are going to prepare to meet the increasing demand for air travel, which I'm glad to say is coming back. So in July of this year, Reno Tahoe Airport, the second largest airport in Nevada, faced a severe shortage of jet fuel available for aircrafts flying out of the airport. This was potentially catastrophic. It's an issue that could have adversely impacted tens of thousands of travelers coming to and from Nevada, and we risked delays in vital cargo coming to our state. Since learned that jet fuel shipments are based on travel trends from the previous year to decide how much jet fuel pipeline space they need to purchase in order to meet the current demand. 
But 2020 demand was artificially low as we dealt with unpredictability of a global pandemic. And we all know that air travel was completely halted in some instances. As such, the data on air travel trends for 2020 is not a reliable gauge for predicting air travel in 2021 or the jet fuel that will actually be necessary to meet these increasing demands. Fortunately, my office in partnership with the airport and the impacted airlines, we did work together to manage the situation. However, I believe we have to be better prepared and to face similar situations going forward if we're trying to base anything on those 2020 numbers. Uh, normally, you could rely on the past year's data, but in this case, we might be better to rely on 2019 data uh, versus 2020. So to the airline representatives today, could each of you please briefly discuss what your airlines are doing to ensure that you have sufficient, sufficient jet supply fuel to meet demand for travel in 2022, which may very well significantly increase or exceed the travel in 2021. And can you discuss a little bit about how you make predictions for future air travel demand generally? Uh, now, given the 2020 was a statistical anomaly. So, Mr. Kelly, we can start with you and go on to Mr. Parker, Mr. Kirby, and then Mr. Lauder, please. Thank you, Senator, and uh, great to see you. And, and uh, we very much appreciate your help uh, last summer. That, that was definitely a, a very stressful uh, situation. Well, I think, um, first of all, uh, we appreciate your help in um, working with the FERC to try to address um, what is obviously a deficiency in the way the uh, uh, pipeline allocations are, are performed. So um, that may require a legislative fix, uh, quite frankly, so we'll need to continue to work on that. But uh, all of us do uh, predictions of future traffic. Uh, we produce schedules. Our schedule is uh, published out through June the 4th, as an example, in 2022. Um, so we know by location how many flights we'll have, uh, what kind of fuel re requirements we have. Uh, we have a team of people that goes out and procures uh, the, uh, 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 the necessary quantities uh, by location. Not all airports have uh, pipeline access, uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, trucks are the primary means of bringing fuel in. And then we also work on uh, storage needs um, uh, as far as jet fuel goes on an airport by airport basis. Um, We've talked uh, this afternoon about uh, uh, personnel shortages across uh, the, the country in various sectors, and uh, we all read about uh, truck driver uh, shortages. So it's definitely something that's a concern. We factor those uh, kinds of constraints into our planning and try to make sure that we don't commit uh, to fly more than what we can uh, supply. Uh, over a long period of time, I am concerned about the pipeline capacity for this country. It is not growing, and yet the country is growing. Uh, so we'll, uh, clearly we'll need uh, jet fuel supplies to meet our needs uh, to grow in the future. We'll need uh, distribution of uh, capabilities to, to meet those needs as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Madam Chair, I see my time is up. So for the remaining, uh, Mr. Parker, Mr. Kirby, and Mr. Lauder, I'll appreciate an answer to this in writing so that we can be sure that we help you do whatever we can to meet the needs, uh, future travel needs for uh, everybody across this nation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Rosen. Let's try Senator Cinema. See if this works this time. Uh, hello, Sharon. Thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Can you hear me, Senator yes. Chair Chairwoman? Yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, we can. As the coronavirus pandemic threatens aviation jobs across the country, Congress's bipartisan effort to pass the PSP saved aviation jobs and ensured that essential travel continued during the pandemic. So the PSP, which was first created under the CARES Act in March 2020, provided vital financial assistance to our domestic airline industry and prevented massive layoffs throughout the aviation sector. The PSP program was an example of Congress working in a bipartisan way to ensure tens of thousands of aviation employees would keep receiving their paychecks and that American travelers would have air service available when they were ready to return to travel. So I appreciate the chair holding this hearing to review the PSP program and to ensure that the recipients of federal assistance met the program's requirements to maintain their payrolls and use federal funds efficiently and effectively. So my first question is both for Mr. Parker and Mr. Kelly. Your airlines, American and Southwest, are the two largest carriers at Arizona's largest airport, Phoenix Sky Harbor. 
So, Mr. Parker, you can go first. Yeah. Please describe the impact of the PSP program on American Airlines staffing in Arizona and flight options for Arizona travelers. Um, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your help in, in getting us to this point. It's, it, it's, um, it's impossible to understate how important PSP was uh, to air travel and to what we would have uh, ended up having for the, the people of Arizona. Um, our hub in Phoenix would have almost certain without PSP, uh, with a loan program versus a PSP program. Um, back in uh, May, April, May of 2020, uh, we likely would have shut the hub down completely and Arizona wouldn't have had air service, at least from American Airlines, as we did everything we could to save money uh, in a time of no demand. And I don't know when it would have started back up. It would have likely been, um, as, as things had played out, it would have likely been until not until the vaccine a year later. So uh, again, it, impossible to uh, to overstate uh, the impact it had. And thank you again for all you did to help get us here. Senator, I'm not sure I can improve upon what Mr. Parker just said. <laughs> so uh, it, it definitely uh, put us in a position of strength. And uh, I'm very grateful uh, for all, all your leadership and support. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, taking care of our people is a, a top priority. So uh, again, thank you very much. Well, thank you. You know, my next question is for Mr. Kirby. Earlier this month, United opened the United Aviate Academy, a state-of-the-art pilot training center at Phoenix Goodyear Airport. How will this training center bring economic opportunity to Goodyear and provide flight training opportunities for individuals from communities that have been traditionally underrepresented in the cockpit? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, and we've talked a lot today in this hearing about the need uh, to create a new pipeline for training pilots. And so we're excited uh, to have to be the first U.S. airline to have our own training academy for pilots there in uh, Arizona. And what we're going to do, uh, our first class started this week um, of 30 students. None of them had flight experience before today. Um, and they'll get training um, and they'll get the opportunity uh, to have training that is, is very similar to what military training is, where they'll fly aerobatics um, and they'll learn much, you will fly in crowded airspace. They'll have a, a very robust training program. Uh, that group of people is 79% people of color. Today um, at United Airlines only, uh, women are people of color. Uh, today at United Airlines only 19% of our pilots are women are people of color and to the best of my knowledge, we have the highest level um, of any airline in the country. That's because there have been historical barriers to entry for women and people of color. There just aren't pilots out, as many pilots out there. So we're going to create and be able to start training the next generation of pilots. We're going to be able to train them better, um, but we're also going to be able to have a diverse group of people, and we expect to be putting 500 um, new pilots through that facility uh, every year. Uh, we're excited about it. Hope it can become a template uh, for other, uh, uh, for the rest of aviation, uh, but also for other jobs around the economy to create training programs where people can get careers um, and have careers, uh, you know, which helps rebuild the middle class uh, in this country. Thank you. You know, my last question will be for Mr. Parker. In November, the CDC instituted new measures to allow for more international travel. And the CDC measures require airlines to keep passenger data for the purpose of contact tracing, which can be shared with public health, health officials if necessary. What are your thoughts on the current process for data collection and contact tracing? And are there changes to those requirements that we should consider? Um, uh, thanks, Senator. We're happy to comply. Um, we it, again, if it's if it's helpful to the CDC, we're happy to happy to collect the data, uh, and we have been doing so. Uh, I don't I don't know that we have any recommendations for more. We 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 collect what we're asked to collect, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Senator Cinema. Uh, is Senator Lummis available? I don't know if she's. Uh, joined us remotely. If not, we'll go to Senator Lujan. Thank you, Chair Camwell, and to Ranking Member Wicker for holding this hearing today, and thank you to our panel of witnesses for joining us. Uh, like most places across America, air travel is vital to New Mexico. Um, it's a key component of our transportation system, um, whether it's keeping families connected, um, tourism that drives our economy, We've seen an increase with film production in our state. Uh, Netflix, NBC, Universal recently opened up some studios, acquired the largest sound stages. Um, New Mexico has seen an upswing with a growing economy as well. 
And as we've seen a return to um, better numbers um, since the pandemic first really took a hit um, to the uh, airline industry, seeing these numbers grow back to 82% of what pre-pandemic levels were for Thanksgiving and 87% now in anticipation with growth going into the end of this year and into next year is where my, my question begins. Um, I voted to fund the payroll support program with the understanding that supporting airline travel would help my constituents stay connected to the world and bolster tourism and economic opportunities back home. So my question for each and each of you is just yes or no. Compared to pre-pandemic levels, has your airline fully restored service schedules for your flight routes to and from New Mexico? Uh, Mr. Parker? Um, we have. We've, we serve uh, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, and Roswell. Uh, we paired back some routes during the pandemic. We restored all of them. Uh, we've actually recently added a route from uh, Santa Fe to LAX. And Mr. Kirby? Uh, we, uh, we also serve three airports. We, we did and continue to serve Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Hobbs. And Mr. Lafter? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I believe that we have restored all service, but I, I will verify that. And Mr. Kelly? We're your number one airline in Albuquerque, so <laughs> I was afraid you were going to skip me. <laughs> uh, we, we have not restored our flight activity across our system, so we're not back uh, where we were. We have increasing flights coming uh, in Albuquerque uh, this month uh, and then again in May, and we hope to have our entire system fully restored, hopefully by early 2023 which would include uh, Albuquerque as well. Early One route in particular, it will take us that long, absolutely. Are there other states in the same situation as New Mexico? It is across our system. Yeah, there's, there's no airline that is back to pre-pandemic uh, flight activity yet. You're the only one on here that's not back to pre-pandemic <laughs> levels for New Mexico. And as you said, you're one of the most important airlines that we have. You are my preferred airline, by the way, um, Mr. Cowley. Uh, when I would fly to and from our nation's capital, um, I can't do that anymore uh, because those, those flights take you through Houston and through other areas, and it's a longer journey. The reason that I'm asking this particular question, I know what many of our colleagues have asked it, is <laughs> when entrepreneurs are looking to make investments or to move around, they do it based on direct hops. The fewer direct hops that we have, and especially with um, a flight that is as affordable, um, with staff as great as you have on Southwest Airlines, it stifles what's happening at home. And so I'm, I'm certainly going to advocate as a member of the Commerce Committee, as a newly elected United States Senator, um, with the power of the vote that I have, with how I can fight for my constituents. And so I look forward to following up on, um, with that conversation um, the other line of questioning that I have, and I don't know if it's come up today, but it's resulted from members in the past, is about bag storage or just bag transparency. Um, I was surprised to see that there is no consistency um, with the size of bags that you can carry on or policies that the airlines follows. Southwest and Spirit follow the recommendations of your trade association, IATA, and have a carry-on bag limit of 50 total inches, Delta, United, and American, 45 inches. So should passengers be required to purchase different check-on bags depending on which airline they're going to fly? I, I don't understand that. And then there, there are the fees. So every airline charges a different amount to check your bag at the gate. And whether or not you have to pay depends on the gate agent often. It's still not consistent um, with flight-to-flight uh, -flight, uh, on the same airline. So the question that I have here, and I'll get through this quickly, uh, Chair Cantwell, uh, Mr. Parker, yes or no, do you believe customers deserve consistent and transparent luggage policies during air travel? Um, yes, I'm mean, certainly across any individual airline. We, we all have, we may have different policies, um, but across any individual airline, yes, we try to give our customers very consistent. And the individual airline, but not across domestic flights as a whole? Uh, I don't, 
we, we don't all have the same policies. No, we have different aircraft that can hold different, that have the ability to hold different capacity in, inside. We're actually quite proud of America now of how we're transitioning all of our airplanes to uh, much larger overheads that will allow all of our customers to bring on a rollerboard aircraft. So as things like that roll out, we end up with different policies depending on what, what type of aircraft we fly. Mr. Kelly? Well, we, we don't charge for bags, so uh, there, there's no uh, at the gate uh, issue uh, with us. Uh, sounds like we've got the biggest bag, so I think we're in good shape on this one. So you think that there should be consistency across the airline well, industry? Well, I, I agree with Doug. I think uh, airplane sizes are different, and uh, overhead bins are different. Uh, we actually have the choice uh, on our aircraft uh, to have different bins uh, ourselves. So um, I, I think that's an individual airline choice and a matter of uh, uh, competitiveness. Mr. Kirby? Uh, we're also investing in larger overhead bins, so a full airplane, everyone can bring, every single customer can bring a roller board on board. Uh, and I think we should be internally consistent um, on how we behave and, and our message to consumers. Um, but I'm not sure that we all, I don't think we should all have to have the same policies. Mr. Lafter? Uh, I would just echo what's been said and say that, you know, we look forward to further conversation on that subject. Oh, and Chair Campbell, I look forward to diving into this more. It just... Senator Menendez brought this back up in 2015, I think most recently, and other senators have raised this. Um, it's inconvenient for constituents, for people that are flying across the country. Policies change depending on when you're at the gate, and uh, most backpacks that you might carry as a carry-on, they don't even fit in that little deal that you check your bags in, um, by the way. And it's fun to watch who's asked to put their bag in there and who's not. Um, just consistency and transparency makes a difference as people are flying through here. So I look forward to following up there. Thanks again, Madam Chair. Thank you. And Senator Lujan, is this a DOE issue on Albuquerque? No, we have gates. All of you are welcome to take up more gates and get more direct flights there. That's what, no, no, I meant so it affects DOE. Oh, most National certainly. lab travel to the United, to here. I mean, I'm just pointing out that you're saying that is hindered. Oh, most certainly. So when you look at... Uh, Sandia National Labs, Los Alamos National Labs, Air Force Research Labs, um, all connected national security apparatus as well. And, and it does make a difference. And as I said, the, the, the most direct flight that save time just isn't available any longer. And that's for all constituents. Well, maybe, maybe and that's, that's just one city. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's some information we could, uh, you know, make available. But I, I would imagine that that DOE traffic and those two labs are the largest one of the largest employers of your state, right? And, Most certainly. And we want that. <laughs> we want that fast access back and forth. But we'll we'll get some data to to people and, and share that. Thank um, you, Chair I don't thank you. Uh, I don't know if Senator Duckworth is joining us remotely. If there's anybody else who's joining us remotely. Senator Blumenthal, did you have a another round that you uh, I have just uh, a few more questions um, following up on my colleague's question. Um, does it cost money, Mr. Kelly, for you to allow passengers to come on your planes without charge? I'm sorry, Senator. Wait, but does it cost money for passengers to bring bags on your plane? And do you, in other words, is there a cost to you of not charging? Is there a cost to us of not charging? Yeah, I can't imagine what it would. Well, be. there there is there's effort involved, obviously, for us to check a bag. Uh, there is weight involved when a customer brings a, a bag on uh, in, into the cabin. But other than just the added weight and their added fuel burn, no, there's no effort on the airline's part. Like we've all said, we invest in overhead bins, and there's uh, wear and tear on those. So there is some. There is an investment. You, have made. you calculated the cost? What you're sacrificing? No. No. I, How I, about I, Mr. I, Parker? Have, have you calculated the cost of either checking or bringing bags on board, carrying bags on board? Um, let, let me. If I, if I don't answer this properly, I'm sure you'll let me know. But I, what I think you're asking is, is there a cost actually of us to to for a customer to check a bag, and do we, which we do charge a fee for? Um, what is the cost? There is. Oh well, sir. 
the cost is everything you see this, that's, that re is required to make to get that bag out of that customer's hand and delivered back to the Monte Carousel. Those are lots of people. Those are bag belts. Those are infrastructure. Indeed, in today's world. But have you calculated? I can understand yeah. in principle that mm -hmm. there's someone at the at the check-in counter. There's someone down next to the plane. Um, there are various people along the line, but what is the total cost? And, and, and again, sorry, much more than that, real estate. In today's world where customers don't need, to, we have airports that were built uh, for people to check in at the airport. Very few people, right. people do that anymore. The only reason most people are checking in outside security is because they have to check a bag. We wouldn't need that <laughs> space in airports, but for those customers that check bags. So the cost of checking bags is, I, I, I have not calculated the cost. Uh, well, that, that question, really but, is but my I know, point. But, but I know there's a significant cost, and the customers that, that use that service uh, cost American Airlines more than those that don't. Uh, I'm just a country lawyer from Connecticut. Yeah. I never went to business school, so I apologize for my sort of clumsiness in trying to put this question to you. But the, the way I view it is that if there is any justification for charging this fee, it must be that you're saying to your customer, look, it costs us X amount either for you to carry on a bag or to check a bag. And what I just heard you say is that you haven't calculated that either per bag or in total. In other words, you don't say to your customer, you know, this is a service and we're going to have to charge you for it. It costs this much for us to do it. You don't calculate that amount. Well, again, I haven't calculated it precisely, but indeed that's exactly what we're saying to the customer. If you want to use that service that, that requires more expense, here's what we charge. Yeah, I understand that's that because that's why I don't check bags. <laughs> right. That's why none of my children check bags. That's why many of us carry bags on. And um, the, the point I'm making is that one of the provisions of the legislation that we've offered is to say to the airlines, you have to justify fees with what the costs are, rather than, in effect, making money. And right now, it seems to me it's a kind of a profit center for you all. Or in any event, you don't, at least according to what you've said to me right now, you don't calculate, you know, the total per year cost per bag is X amount. The total for a bag of 50 pounds or more is X, Y, or Z. So I think what I'm asking all of you to do, uh, those who do charge those fees to check bags or to carry on bags, is to provide us with the costs that you regard as your airline having to pay wherever it goes and maybe specify how it does go, whether it's labor, machinery, you know, obviously there's machinery to get the bag onto the plane. Um, so that's what I'm asking. And just to be clear, we don't, we don't charge. We don't charge to carry on a You've bag. You've said that or now a, a number of times, I think, <laughs> Mr. Kelly. Uh, we have that on the record. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But I think you're, you kind of prove my point, which is, and it, and it goes to the question I think that's been raised about consistency, why do some airlines do it and some not? Why do some charge X amount and others not? Um, and I think that fee or charge, if you're a consumer, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, looking at your airlines, you kind of scratch your head and say, they must just be using this fee to make money off me. Mr. Mr. Trethaway, do you have any comments here? I feel like we should give you at least the last word before we close out. You've sat here the entire time and uh, paid attention. I didn't even see you looking at your electronic devices. Um, do you have a comment on this about how airlines are choosing the uniqueness of different services and how that is working out in the, in the marketplace, both for consumers and driving down cost and also on choice? Yes, I do have some comments. First, can you hear me? I want to make sure yes. I'm on. Yes, yes, we okay. hear you. Sorry. To so um, you could choose to re-regulate the airlines. I think that would be a big mistake. A regulated era served wealthy passengers, 
some business travelers, but it didn't serve 80% of Americans. Deregulation has been phenomenal. Um, the airlines, I don't think, should be ashamed about making some money. If you look at the profits of this industry, the post-war era, and I always have to remind my students when I say that, I mean 1945, not 1991, uh, have lost dramatic amounts of money. They have to make money someplace. If you want really low ticket prices, then you have to find places where can some passengers pay a bit more. And the airlines have found things like there's no extra cost of the seat up at the bulkhead versus the seat further back. But some passengers are willing to pay for that. And those passengers help offset the fixed costs of flying the aircraft. So I think that moving to a pure cost basis for setting charges will reduce, will, will reverse uh, what's almost now 45 years of the benefits of a market solution. Uh, if I may respond. Yes, Madam please Chair. go ahead. Uh, Although I really do want to get out of here years, before six o'clock. 45 years is longer than I've been flying. Uh, but uh, no one here is proposing, Mr. Trethway, that we re-regulate airline. Uh, I would suggest, by the way, that we've had a lot of consolidation and we have the essentially the airline industry of America sitting before us because of consolidation that has occurred, because of lax enforcement of our antitrust laws. I don't know that anyone on the panel will agree with me on that fact, but no one is, is suggesting that we regulate airlines, nor do we regulate a lot of other industries or companies when we apply basic rules of consumer protection. Rules of the road. I've suggested a Bill of Rights. So uh, I don't want to be misunderstood, Mr. Trethway, as suggesting we need another civil aeronautics board, I think it was called. Am I right about that? Yes. Um, I, I may not have been flying 45. Well, maybe I would. <laughs> but uh, we, we're done with the ICC. We're done with the CAB. Deregulation uh, was welcome, but we're talking here about basic rights that should be enforced. And um, I'm all in favor of competition, which many of you have urged, and I hope that the government will help to promote competition, not impede it. And I just want to finish by thanking you all. I think all of you agreed that you would work with me on this idea of a Bill of Rights. I'm not interpreting you as committing to anything specific, but your willingness to help in that endeavor uh, is very well. Well, I certainly will look forward to working with you on Thank it. You. And I think uh, my question to Mr. Trethaway was really to, to spark uh, this, this question. I do think, you know, we have lots of opportunities for growth around the globe, um, but we also want to make sure consumers are a big part of the equation. So I you know, appreciate your, your work on this. So, And Madam Chair, I thank you for your support. You have been a real consumer advocate. Thank you. Um, so I want to make a point for the record that uh, we also have had testimony from ALPA, the Pilots Association. I didn't mention that at the beginning, as I mentioned other airlines that we've also received testimony for. As I mentioned, this hearing is part of our overall effort to produce a report on the PSP program, which we will do in the beginning of uh, next year, hopefully the first quarter. Um, so the hearing will remain open until January 12th. 2021. So any senators who would like to submit a question to you all for the record uh, need to do so by December 29th, uh, 2021. And we would ask you to respond to that uh, before January 12th of 2021. Wait, that doesn't make sense of 2022. Can't believe that. So with that, I want to thank all our witnesses for being here. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's been a while since the airline CEOs have been up here. I can't remember the last time the flight attendants have been here, but I think you can see from this attendance, we had more, I think 20 members show up. You could see the range of questions. You could see the concern and the issues that were raised and 
I think uh, people have worked in a bipartisan effort and want to continue to figure out how we can move forward together. So thank you all very much. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This taxpayer thanks you. <laughs>